people of the internet welcome to modern day debate tonight we are debating evolution versus creation and we are starting right now i am kaz host of the atheist edge tonight we have uh team creation which is uh nathan and jamie versus dr chris thompson and snake uh, snake was right and tonight we're gonna have team creation going first nathan is gonna be the very first they're gonna get seven minutes for their opening statement so nathan at your first word i will start your timer the floor is all yours thank you very much kaz thank you very much everyone for being here uh, this is going to be about creation and evolution. And uh, so in my opener here, I want to kind of state a uh, premise to why I believe this is an important discussion. Uh, I know some people that are on the evolution side will say that in the uh, fields of science that it's already settled and it's not a debate. Uh, it's not unreasonable to think that people who go to school and are taught evolution also apply that to the worldview. But I do think that this is important uh, for a few reasons, uh, I'll get into my personal one after this, but I did actually want to uh, share my screen here and get into, let's see, share screen. Uh, is there a way to share? Yeah, tab? so if you go to the bottom and you see where it says uh, present, the uh, yep. TV symbol, click on that. Um, click on share screen and then, uh, if you're doing it, yeah, there you go. You got it. Okay. So, um, if, uh, up here, uh, I have a few tabs, um, and these are actually some things by, uh, the military. I think part of why this is such an important discussion is because it is determining who we are. It is determining what we are, uh, what our responsibilities are towards one another. If we are animal humans, or if we are soul containing humans. Uh, you, it, it may or may not be easier to do certain actions. So what I actually have here is uh, this is a proposal by the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States military wanting to propose an attack on uh, our own people. Uh, and this is called Operation Northwoods. They wanted to attack Miami, D.C. to try to start a false flag war. Uh, and so this in, in the military, there, military, there is something called desensitizing. Uh, so you have to get people to see others as enemies, as animals, as lesser than human, um, and not as human beings with a life, with family, with loved ones, with uh, goals and dreams and things that they want to do in this life. Uh, you get here, this is uh, something called Operation Top Hat, where uh, our own military did use a nerve agent on the military personnel of our own country without asking them. Uh, and so this is kind of something that is is unethical, but if you're testing and it's for research, then you can do it. And if you can do it to your own military, uh, you should also be able to do it to your own people, according to uh, the people that are in power and able to give orders in the military. And this is uh, this is Operation Sea Spray, where they released a, a bacterial weapon on San Francisco uh, without asking uh, the people and uh, people were injured and somebody did die. And this this could be anybody. This is um, kind of a this is part of why we, we need to have. In society today, with all what is going on, this is we have to look at why people do not value one another's lives. And then this even does get into the, the Gulf of Tonkin, which was a false flag uh, event that got us into Vietnam, which caused a lot of suffering, a lot of death, a lot of trauma, a lot of I mean, I mean death is the ultimatum. Um, and so I, I wanted to share that to kind of lay a uh, a premise for why this is, is such an important topic. If we are animal, whatever the truth is, if we really are animals, if we really are souls, we have to know and we have to be able to communicate. No animal has made the internet and has communication technologies that we have where we can literally talk to one another to prevent any sort of violence from ever even happening. If you have a disagreement with someone, you talk it out and you work through it. We're not animals. We don't need to have self-defense or a need to get territorial or want to attack people. We are supposed to be reasonable. Um, even though, unfortunately, some people um, may not actually carry this out in their behavior. And if they are in positions of power, they can actually do some pretty dark uh, things. And so uh, why I actually say that, too, is so if you're going to school to uh, to learn a science, uh, you're going to have to learn evolution. Uh, I'm actually in the beginning processes of that. Um, I'm, I'm going for a degree for nutritional cardiology. Uh, and so I actually... Uh, have here this is an angiogram a reversal of the leading cause of death in our country the only way in our medical data this is shown is with vegan eating and i want to write a paper about the uh 
metabolic about the metabolism metabolism of human beings and why it is that we are designed to eat plants and uh, and why it is able to get these effects of reversal of the leading cause of death, not just prevention, but someone who already has it can reverse it. And I have to write it through an evolutionary narrative. So I wanted to write I want to write a paper about going to uh, fr starting from the very first life form that forms because evolution has to start or there's nothing to even talk about. And so going from that very first life form all the way till now, addressing key metabolic developmental points to where we are now able to eat plants and get these reversals in heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune conditions, et cetera. Uh, this is done with plants. And uh, I've gone to several professors and, and they, they don't, um, there, there's no start for, for life. We don't ever observe anywhere in nature where there's an increase in energy uh, and an increase in order. It's one or the other. Uh, and this is the, the start of evolution. You, you can't talk about a tree if there's no seed. You can't have a building that's held up if there's no foundation in first floor. And, and uh, then so that's at, at the very start. And then essentially, if, if you can't show that you can even start your idea, you, you then the rest of it is taken on belief that it can happen naturally. And if you have to involve a creator for theistic evolution, then that would just essentially make it supernatural anyway. So you're no longer in the realm of science. Um, I do believe that many evolutionary scientists are good people One minute. and while well, the science is legit for a lot of what they do it's a it's a very thin veneer of worldview that gets put onto things interpretations that can be made uh i, I think it's um there, there are predictions that can be made with either model uh but even if you want to say evolution can't make predictions because nothing has any guidance towards where it's going in the future so there wouldn't be able to be a prediction of when what would turn into what um if you would you know, uh, this kind of is unethical, but like if you picked up a worm and dropped it on the table over and over and over, uh, over time, would it develop armor, like a, a sort of stale, develop new novel um, material to be able to protect it from falling? Well, they were able to do that with wings for birds and uh, get into the air. So uh, novel things can't be predicted and they don't actually show up. Uh, it's just a reaccessing of what is already in our gene code. Um, so that actually, I got pretty close to the time there, but, uh, all right, uh, Jamie, I'll, I'll throw it over to you. All right, Jamie, your first word, I'll start your timer. All right. So, um, <clears throat> my name is Jamie. I run the, uh, studio 215 YouTube channel. Um, right now the main project that I'm doing is a Bible study, but I also have other projects focused on evolution, uh, that will be posted as well. Um, the main one is the evolution exposed video series. Um, so I didn't really prepare anything for tonight just because the fact that creation versus evolution as a topic name is a very broad topic. Um, as Chris Thompson said, there's so many things that we can talk about when it comes to this subject. Um, so I guess just overall, I kind of want to point to the fact that creation and evolution is not as different as people want to make it out to be. They are opposite sides of essentially the same spectrum. I was watching one of uh, Chris Thompson's debates to get to get an idea of who he was. And at the beginning, he said, this is not a debate of science. This is a debate of philosophy. And that is 100% true. The philosophy of evolution versus the philosophy of creation. Uh, and so that's essentially what we're looking at tonight. We're not looking at science. We're looking at philosophies that add their interpretation onto science. So I am 100% okay with saying that creation is the religious interpretation from a Christianity view. Whereas evolution is going to be the religious interpretation from a atheistic view. Um, and I see he's shaking his head, but we'll get into that when we get to the open discussion. Uh, because the thing is that no matter what data is presented to you, we can, we can literally bring you, if it was possible and I were to be able to bring you the blood of Jesus Christ and you tested it, you would find an evolutionary way to explain it. So it doesn't matter what the data is. What matters is the interpretation. Um, <clears throat> that's the, really the biggest point that I want people to notice here. Cause when we go through this, um, I don't know if I'll even pull up any of my past presentations during this debate, but I never quote, um, I never quote creationists when I'm making my argument, whenever I'm trying to make a point, I will quote an evolutionist because I know that people that believe in evolution will reject anything that comes from a creationist because they just don't find that that's a viable source, no matter how accredited they are. So what I do is I will quote evolutionists and I actually had a debate two days ago where that's what I did. And in the, uh, in the, in the chat of that, of that debate, the whole thing they were saying was 
you can't quote an evolutionist because they don't believe creation. So whether I quote a creationist or whether I quote an atheist, it's not good enough for the evolutionary side of the argument. Um, but I just wanted to kind of set that precedent so that people can see that this is a pattern that we're going to be going through during this debate. Now, as far as evidence for creation versus evidence for evolution, um, I think the strongest evidence for creation in itself is the fact that there is life on earth. There is no explanation for life. Plenty of scientists have tried to figure it out. Abiogenesis is a very hardy field of science. And as much money as they spend, as many doctors, as many scientists, as many people that are working on abiogenesis, they have absolutely zero solid answers for how life began. They all have theories. They all disagree with each other. And they all are basically you know, at each other's necks trying to figure out how this could have possibly happened. The fact that we have life is a miracle of God. Just like the Bible says, he formed us from the dust and he breathed life into our nostrils. So until, the, until scientists in a lab can bring forth life from absolutely nothing, that means don't grab a box of molecules in a bottle that's been purified and preserved on a shelf. Uh, that means don't grab some dirt from outside like God did. Uh, that means making it from 100% scratch until they can do that. I'm going to go ahead and say that life in itself is the best evidence for creation. Now, as far as evolution goes, there's a lot of things that if I was an evolutionist, because I used to be on the team evolution before I you know, started make, going public with my ministry, uh, before I got saved, I was into evolution and I did believe it. And there's a lot of fields that could be used for very good evidence to people that don't really study, uh, but it could be presented in such a way that it seems like convincing evidence. And yet evolutionists don't study these topics. They try and veer away from these topics because they're afraid that there's going to be a creationist perspective brought up from it. Um, so I think it's interesting that all of the things that I would have done as, a, as an evolutionist, they don't do. And all of the things that they do as an evolutionist, I find are very easy to dismantle when you actually take the time. And I understand that not everyone has the time to do it. But when you actually take the time to read the papers, uh, see what both sides of the argument has to say, uh, when you do that, you will actually see that most of the time creation has the better answer. I'm not going to use my full um, seven minutes just because I just kind of wanted to set a precedence. I, I really like to, when it's a broad topic like creation versus evolution, I really like to just kind of hear what their what their points they're trying to make are, and I just kind of respond to those. Uh, so I'll go ahead and end my time now. All right. Thank you so much, Team Creation. And now we'll kick it over to Team Evolution. And I believe Snake is going first. So Snake, get your first word. I will start your timer. And if if you could just make me larger, does that work? Or I can share my screen? Sure, I can uh, make you larger, no problem. Okay. One second. Okay. okay. So um, we didn't really hear much evidence at all. So creationists have a major methodological problem. Science is great, but it seems creationism doesn't understand quite what it is. The basic aim and method of science is to seek rules and principles that explain, and more importantly, predict the operation of observable things. Evolution does this, creationism cannot. We can explain lightning with Zeus, but we, can pr we can't predict anything about lightning or electricity with that hypothesis. So the theory that gives us predictions is always the stronger and by definition scientific. If you can predict how something works reliably, then you know how it works, especially if you are the first and only to do so, i.e. novel predictions. The fossil record is exclusively predictable by evolution, same for the mere existence of transitional forms, as well as uh, predicting where in the rocks they'll be and their features. Evolution and Earth's age are cross-confirmed by nuclear physics, thermodynamics, chemistry, mathematics, archaeology, geology, paleontology, astronomy, comparative genomics, comparative anatomy, and others, as well as the numerous predictions of biological functions, fossil record predictions, uses in technology and medicine, real results. Even old Earth creationists consistently dunk on young Earthers because in science, hypotheses can be tested. Cross-confirmation and predictions are the gold standard of scientific evidence. But we do have some common ground. Creationists accept evolution happens and did happen after the Ark, but they do not accept common ancestry. So, but how do we know all elephants are the same kind? How do we know all canids are the same kind? We never saw dogs come from wolves. We never saw the speciation of elephants. We never saw triceratops come from triceratops. So what's going on here? 
The creationist method involves just thinking about personal experience with animals and declaring groups to be obvious. How scientific. They literally just say they feel like things belong in certain groups, and this creates problems like the fact that they group things in different groups. So they fall back on comparative anatomy. But the question is, where is what's the limitation of this lim method? How can we know where and when to stop concluding ancestry from anatomical similarity? And it is unnecessary for the creationist worldview. Creationist ministries declare fossil horses like Mesohippus is in the horse kind based on comparative anatomy. Seems obvious, right? But that's evolution from three toes to one toe, which is a functional design change equivalent to something as drastic as a human walking on one finger. Grecians admit this huge functional change can happen as well as that snakes could easily have evolved from lizards. They even declare what the oldest snakes were. Based only on vertebra and lower jaw fragments. How do they know these are snakes? Why do they use comparative anatomy, and where does this method stop working? Since the fossil record shows gradual change, predictable by evolution, there doesn't appear to be anywhere we should stop using this method. Why? Because we observe this, that changes in the size, proportion, uh, shape, orientation, location, number, function, and chemical composition of bones, as well as muscles, organs, and tissues. They can all change within creationist declared biblical kinds. Creationists cut off the evolutionary trees like this as separate creations, but there's a curious trend they all ignore, which is that the bases of these trees tend to be more similar to each other than they are to their own branches. The base of the wolf kind, the base of the cat kind, the base of the weasel kind, and the base of the carnivore kind all look like the exact same animals. Coincidence? Even bears and seals terminate with the same body plan of small flat-footed carnivores at the root of their families, which means by creationist methods, the tree of similarity should look more like this, If that is, if they were consistent. Creationists have to shove thousands of species into kinds because they can't fit them all in Noah's Ark, so saber-toothed cats and all other cats are considered related by this process of comparative anatomy. Same with fossil horses and modern horses, but this establishes a high degree of variation within their kinds. The gap within horses is larger than the gap between the roots of horses and other kinds like tapers. So that's only consistent with this pattern. The amount of accepted, diverse, uh, accepted variation or diversity within kinds is larger than the gaps between the kinds, especially when we add in transitional forms that bridge the gaps. If it's in, if it's in its own kind, the diversity overlaps. If it's in uh, one of the two kinds, it just increases the accepted diversity range within it and shrinks the gap to non-existence, resulting in a unified kind. So there is a major methodological problem here. Meanwhile, this relationship with the much larger morphological gap is accepted based on nothing but morphology. So what's going on here? It's inconsistent. Smaller gaps are not accepted for some reason. To demonstrate this, this is a paper showing creation has tried to come up with methods categorizing biblical kinds or baromens, but this backfired. It's about uh, mor morphological distance of clusters having larger size gaps between them than the total size of the cluster itself. But as more fossils were discovered, the gap shrank and the baromens collapsed in each other. Creationist methods proved birds are dinosaurs. If evolution was true, how would we know? Predictions and cross-confirmation. Dating methods predict where oil reserves will be, thus it is used to find oil. Evolution predicts where fossils are and what they are, thus it is used to find them and predict other things about biology. Creationism cannot do either and is thus scientifically useless. It serves only to protect religious myths. We can use sciences to be so sure of events that have no witnesses or no records that can't be reviewed that we can predict, uh, convict people beyond a reasonable doubt. On the flip side, how do we know certain hypotheses are incorrect? Incorrect preclusionary evidence. In order to preclude evolution, creationists need to show some kind of limitation that would prevent these animals from being related, but they can't. Every single change necessary here has been observed. Same with these fossils. Same with these fossils, same with these fossils, same with these fossils, meaning that these two, which are the beginning and the end of that series, are connected by a series of animals that are all the same kind by creationist methods. Can creationists preclude these changes? Absolutely not. Can science preclude creationism? Yes. And here are just a couple ways. The heat problem, the plankton problem, and the limestone deposition problem. If our dating methods are wrong, that means the amount of radioactive decay in the creationist young earth would have melted the earth several times over, the equivalent of several hundred thousand thermonuclear bombs per square mile. The amount of plankton found in the fossil record would have made the oceans a jelly sludge during Noah's flood, and the known limestone deposition rate would need to be sped up miraculously. The creationist rate project tried to find a solution to the heat problem, but concluded only a miracle or exotic new physics could solve it. This is about science, not miracles or wishful thinking. Thank you. 
All right. Thank you so much, Snake. And now we will kick it over to Dr. Thompson for your opening statement. Dr. Thompson, at your first word, I'll start your timer. The floor is all yours. And you're muted, I think. You're muted. Yeah, still muted. <laughs> I should be open now. All right. Okay. Good. Great. So very nice job, Taylor. A uh, little bit about me. I'm a, uh, Chris Thompson. I'm a professor of neuroscience at Virginia Tech. I'm not an expert in uh, evolutionary biology. I did study evolution at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. That doesn't make me an expert. Um, I do find this topic to be very interesting. It's something that I'm pretty passionate about, which is why I like you know, talking about this. Um, I do study how hormones shape, uh, my lab studies this, how hormones shape the development and plasticity of neural circuits. And we study this in a wide range of species. We can do this because all animals are descended from a single common ancestor, and we can uh, use the same comparative morphology arguments that, that Taylor made uh, very explicitly and you know compare these things to the human condition. Uh, the views I expressed tonight are my own. So, you know, lots of lines of evidence to support evolution. Taylor just walked through most of it. Fossil evidence, you know, really nice description of comparative morphology. Um, biogeography is another one that I would like to get into if we have time tonight. But one thing I'm going to highlight is genetics. So genetics is really a slam dunk case for evolution. Chromosomes are very similar in closely related species. And then they start to vary more as you get farther apart from, uh, you know, evolutionary relationships. So amongst the great apes, we can look at chromosome patterns and see that they're very, very similar. For instance, this is an image taken from a paper from 1982 published in Science. What we're looking at is the chromosome patterns in the great apes. So let's take a little closer look at one of these. So this is chromosome one. And what we have here is the chromosome one of humans, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans. And as you can see, the overall pattern is incredibly similar this is true across all chromosomes. Now, of course, it's not just about patterning. We can look at the genetic or protein level, and we can see very uh, similar patterns in closely related species. For instance, this is one of Sal Cordova's favorite proteins, the DNA topor isomerase 1. And you can see that the protein sequence from humans versus chimps is identical, 100%. Every single amino acid is exactly the same. This is generally going to be true when you compare proteins or genes between hymns and uh, humans, you're gonna find some differences, but a lot of similarities. Now, if we add a third species to look at, for instance, a mouse, we can start to see some differences. So if you compare the human sequence to the mouse sequence, we start to see substitutions and insertions. This is the phylogenetic challenge. So we can take the phylogenetic challenge. The phylogenetic challenge is you have two animals and then a third animal. You can compare all three animals. You're inevitably going to find two of them to be more similar than the third. And this is going to be true within kinds, but it's also going to be true outside of kinds. And you're going to go further and further down the line. So, for instance, we can go further down the line here and compare, say, humans to chickens and or mice. And then you're going to find that the human and mouse is going to be similar, more similar than they, either of them are to the chicken. And then from there, you can go humans and chickens versus, say, fish or the roundworm. And you're going to find more and more differences, yet a lot of similarities. We can go on and on with every single gene in the genome, just like this. So let's go back to the chromosomes. And one thing someone might have noticed is that, oh, you know what, Dr. Chris, what you talking about? You know, we got 23 pairs of chromosomes in humans, but 24 pairs of chromosomes in the other great apes. You know, why are humans different from the other great apes as far as numbers of chromosomes go? Well, one thing that we do know is that if we look at chromosome two, so right up here, this is chromosome two, um, we see that humans have a single pair for chromosome two, yet for chimps, gorillas, and orangutans, they actually have two pairs of chromosomes that share similarity with one half of the human version and another half of the human version. What this means is that there must have been a fusion event, a chromosome fusion event between 2A and 2B um, at, on, on the lineage to come to humans. We know this because we can see that there's a telomer telomer fusion site where these ends would have fused. And we also know that there's a cryptid centromere, which is like the origin point within a chromosome, these little notches or centromeres. There's a cryptid centromere, so it's all broken down in this exact place where that would have been. What this means is that in the phylogenetic tree for the great apes, 
the chromosomes 2A and 2B must have fused in um, after the last common ancestor between humans and chimps. <clears throat> we can also talk about endogenous, uh, the sites of endogenous retroviruses throughout the genome. I'm not going to go through that data right now. Perhaps we can talk about it in a little bit. Uh, but this is fully consistent with the idea of descent with modification, and it completely contradicts any version of the creationist model. So what do creationists believe? Well, you know, uh, they believe that the Earth is 6,000 years old, 6,500 years old. You know, that extra 500 years actually makes a difference. Um, versus what evolutionists believe, which is on the order of 4.6 billion years old. So we're talking many orders of magnitude different. Uh, the first man was created from a pile of dust, as Jamie referred to. And that the first woman was created from a man's rib. And I'm more, kind of curious how the genetics worked on that. Um, that there was a worldwide flood um, 2,000 years after creation uh, that killed almost all life on Earth. And that was around 4,400 years ago. That there was a man and his three sons built a wooden boat and put pairs, sometimes seven pairs, of 1,384 different quote-unquote kinds of animals on that boat. I get that number from Answers in Genesis. I know creationists debate how many kinds there are. They can't even really give a good definition for what a kind is. Hopefully that's something we can get into. Um, they believe that all the diversity that we see currently on life on Earth within kinds emerged within the just last 4,400 4, years. And despite the fact that One virtually minute. every single kind would have faced near extinction due to inbreeding depression, and then the last thing I'm going to mention is that humanity, so according to creationists, they believe that humanity tried to build a tower up to heaven, but God put a stop to it and he confused their languages. And so therefore all of humanity had to dis disperse. And they believe that this is then the model for the evolution of language. This completely contradicts everything in the field of linguistics, anthropology, uh, and neuroscience. And so hopefully this is some things that we can get into. And I'm going to leave it there. All right, thank you so much, Team Create. I mean, so, I'm sorry, Team Evolution. Uh, we will go ahead and kick it into the open discussion in just a moment. But before we do that, I just want to let everybody know, especially if it's your first time joining us on Modern Day Debate, that we are a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics, and we want you to feel welcome no matter what walk of life you're from. And if you have a question or a comment for one of tonight's debaters, fire it into the old live chat and be sure to tag me at Modern Day Debate. Super chats will go to the top of the list. All we ask is that you keep it civil, attack the argument, and not the person as insults will not be read. And our guests are linked to the description below whether you're listening on youtube or one of the many podcast platforms that we are on so if you like what you've heard tonight please don't hesitate to hit those links and hit the subscribe button because we have plenty more debates coming your way that you don't want to miss including i believe tomorrow at 1 p.m uh, we have the perfect dawa versus matt dillahunty and they're going to be debating islam so that's going to be something you don't want to miss so be sure to hit the subscribe button and with that we're going to go ahead and kick it into the open discussion so gentlemen i will leave it to you the floor is all yours Right. So, uh, why so, why do you guys call this an atheist religion when the majority of Christians believe in it? Great question. Do you have you ever seen life form naturally without interference from men? Uh, that like, doesn't ever really answer that? the question. I mean, well, what, it, what do you mean by that? I see. Have, have you ever just sure? Like, I put you know in my lab, I study frogs. I study tadpoles. I put two frogs together. And then I see them make babies, and then we have tadpoles. Um, do you, do you I ever, mean, I guess I did that, but I know that they do that in the wild too. Yeah, and that's so. Like, why I say, like, if you've ever seen non-life naturally become alive without relay synthesis or man interfering or trapping and vacuum chambers and everything, if this you've has never nothing. Seen life form. Well, this has nothing to do with the debate. Religion, well, it's because well, yeah, it does have to do with the debate. I mean, no, hold on, hold on, Nathan. Let me just respond to this question right quick. Uh, so, one, yes, life coming into existence does have to do with the debate because you want to pretend that evolution stops at the macro stage, but you're only you're only showing one piece of the puzzle. As much as you shake your head, no, you have to have life in order for life to evolve. Sure. But right, and it could have been created. As, right. Okay, so it could have been created. So I'm glad that you admit that evolution is your creator. Now, your question was, why nope. do we call well, evolution an atheist religion when a lot of Christians believe it, right? That's the, that's the question you want to answer to? Yeah. Uh, the reason for that is because the church society today has been conditioned into submission. So instead of standing up boldly for their faith, they have cowered and tucked their tail between their legs. 
figuratively because we don't actually have tails because we were never animals. But that's why, because they would rather be accepted by man than to speak the truth of the Bible. Um, I wrote down so many notes from what y'all said because there's so many talking points that I want to go over from <clears throat> y'all's presentation, do you, but I don't want to take mind, up all the I time. Just, so go ahead and uh, someone say something. We So we'll just, abiogenesis so I, is not relevant to this at all. God could have created or any or aliens could have created the first life. We are <laughs> looking at the question, is there common ancestry between all life? That is what the question of evolution is. That is what the debate of evolution is. It has nothing to do with origins of life. Those are separate fields of study for a, re for a reason. And this is just obfuscation, and I will not talk further about it. We, were, we are only here to debate evolution. Common well, ancestry. we are debating evolution. The topic is common evolution. Why? evolution. So, sure. You know, right. Yeah. So, and, common descent with, and it is uh, like descent RNA with, with evolving into DNA. Mm -hmm. Um. So, but that's part of like why why I had brought that up is because there are beliefs involved that defy what we have ever observed in nature. We've never seen non-life to life, and I think if that did happen, if someone made that happen, it would be put in a biology textbook at the start because it's the start. Now you have this first life that has to split into different domains. So this uh, first common ancestor, which once it became the LUCA, the last universal common ancestor, it diversified into, say, fungi, amoeba, uh, plants and animals. All of this has to you have to show that one population can diversify into several different cell structures of different populations of domains. Kind is one thing, okay. but showing a domain split is even more difficult. Okay, so we perhaps we should talk about um, standards of evidence. So do you, do you need to actually witness something to demonstrate that it's happened or have it be a scientific claim? Well, you don't um, need to 100% witness it happening, but you have to have solid evidence for it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're referring to comparing bones in the ground that you mix and match together like 15 puzzle pieces to make one picture, um, then that's not reliable data to base your assumptions off of. Um, what exactly are you referring to when you say we don't have to see it in order to consider it science I mean, just take a look at the field of forensics i mean taylor referred to that right so forensics is the idea of evaluating a crime scene obviously something happened and drawing evidence on what happened there and trying to find out who did what right uh we can take genetic evidence you can take um you know uh, a, an assessment of the crime scene um there's a lot of things that you can take into account physical evidence that you can draw from a crime scene and and draw conclusions about what happened, right? Like that's forensics, the field of forensics. And evolution is very, very similar to that. You know, we we call we draw inferences based on um, the expected outcomes of descent with modification. But does it make sense that the, the inferences that you draw, like if you say looking at the, the basic body plans of some four-legged animals, this this is a more similar than the the distance of like horses, for example, within their own gene pool those inferences that you are making that would be forensically valid, those are the, the same creationist, the, the creationist point on that is, is this is to the same affair. Like you can have a similar designer cause these similar genetics, cause these similar bone structures. If four legged walking animals, it, it's a good, apparently it's a good design because it's an expression of four legged animals that they have, are like arms up front, legs in the back. They're bent over in a digigrade stance. They're, they have their spine going along the top, the rib cage. It's all good design, but it's bones. I mean, there are people who have taken um, uh, like a, a picture of uh, skeletons of like rabbits and dogs and everything. And then they say draw it and they make them look like freak mutants and everything. Like what your skeletal system is, it can be, you, you don't look like your skeleton right away. You can be pretty different actually on the skeletal fossil layout um, and, and having like bigger creatures uh, or, or different size legs or uh, limbs uh, there. I mean, people are like that as well. Like uh, I bet all of us have a different wingspan for our arms. That doesn't mean that we are, are different species or going into different species. Um, so I think that's, it's uh, both sides cover that basis of our observations of the natural world by saying common ancestor or common designer. 
Right. So your explanation for why certain animals look similar and also have similar genomes is that there's a common design, right? Like the designer sat at his or her designer desk and, you know, was was like, OK, I got to make the, the mouse kind. So I'm going to pick the mouse genes to make the mouse kind. Right. And then the dog kind, we're going to pick the, the dog genes for the dog kind. And then the bear kind, we're going to pick bear genes for the bear kind. And of course, those bear genes are going to be pretty similar to the dog genes because both bears and dogs kind of have lim similar lifestyles. And that's why yeah, there's, the genomes well, there's a, there's of bears and dogs are similar. Is that the idea? To, to an extent, they are similar, yes. Yeah. So there's a problem with that. Uh, convergent evolution completely discounts the idea of common design uh, allowing uh, explaining why common morphology and common genetics would be consistent. Yes, in general, we, we see that, but convergent evolution completely undergirds that, that, uh, that, that issue. So if I could share my screen real quick, um, I got a few slides I want to share. Uh, ba -bum. Okay, hopefully that's up. Great. So um, we can compare the genomes and the, the, the genetic sequence of various genes, right? And I, I kind of walked through this, how say the human, certain genes in, within humans are similar to the way they are in chimpanzees. And of course, with the phylogenetic um, challenge is that you can compare it to outgroups, right? We can compare like rodents to each other. So this is a mouse and then this is a rat. And we're talking about the potassium channel, the uh, version 6.2, okay? So the thing about this is that um, the creationists believe that there was like a single kind of mouse that was on the ark. Um, now, myomorphs is the superfamily of that. The myrimoid is the, um, or actually, uh, the myomorphs is the order. Myrioids are the superfamily. Um, I know that the answers in Genesis says that the myrioids were a single kind that was on the ark. Um, within myomorphs, we have 1,502 24 different species within the myrioids it's on the order of around 1,300 different species. Anyway, these are all mouse-like rodents. And we have this many different species within 4,400 years. And creationists believe that all these species came about from a single pair that was on the ark. Well, this includes animals can, like can mice. I just Sure. Just to add, so <clears throat> I don't, I, I just want to establish, I don't claim to know how many mice or rodent-like kinds there were on the mm -hmm. ark it could have been one pair it could have been three or four or five sure. or six um especially if you're bringing on baby mice they're probably not taking up too much space now so, that would be very different <clears throat> than what answers in genesis says that's okay i don't know if it's, it's just three or four or five or six that it really changes things too much though so here's a bunch of different rodents right there's a bunch of rodents on the screen um we've got the mouse we've got the rat You've got this guy, the jackless jackless, although this isn't a myrioid, this is in the myomorphs, uh, gerbils and voles. You believe that all rodents came from a single kind, or I guess maybe a couple of different kinds. Um, but mice, the rodents look like rodents, right? And of course, we can also talk about moles, that moles look like moles, right? Everything on here is a mole. And carnivores look like carnivores, right? We've got dogs and bears and uh, uh, um, foxes, and uh, here's a dog. Uh, bear and a wolf, right? So, you know, carnivores look similar. And so they have similar form. And so if we go back to the rodents here, and if we just start doing genetic comparisons within this, um, if we're going to compare the uh, the potassium ion channel 1.1 to others, if we compare the mouse to itself, obviously that's 100%. But if you compare the mouse to the other uh, rodents, you know, it's also very, very similar, around 99.6% similar if you're comparing it at the protein level. Now, when you compare the mouse protein of KV 1.1 to humans, it's 98%, right? It's an outgroup, so it's going to be different. But the thing is, we have these guys over here, and their similarity is much less. It's 95% similar. So there's, it's still very similar, but it's even less than humans, despite the fact that these things look like rodents. And we can do this for other potassium ion channels, right? KV 2.1, compare the mouse to the other rodents, it's around 96% or so, 95%. But if you compare it to, uh, to humans, now it's around 93%, right? That's the outgroup. But if you compare it to these guys, now it's 85% and 84%. And you can do this for every single gene in the genome. Now we're looking at KV 6.2, right? Mouse to these other guys is around 94%. To humans, it's around 90%. 
But to these guys, it is around 70%. Now, Nathan, I know you know the answer to this, but I'm curious if Jamie happens to know why these two guys over here, despite the fact that they look so much like rodents, have this uh, genetic similarity and protein similarity that's so much different, worse than humans. All right, so there's a couple of points I'd like to make to that argument. Uh, sure. The first point is, Answers in Genesis is not the end-all be-all for creation science research, okay? Just like how there's millions of, or there's thousands of different abiogenesis professors that can't agree on anything, I could use that all day to say, hey, your guys don't know what they're talking about. But it's the same thing with creation. We have different people that have different sure. perspectives. Fair now, enough. as far as as far as what we're looking at with uh, the comparison between the DNA, uh, first off, the DNA in itself is incredibly complex, and we're still barely scratching the surface. But as far as the argument you made in regards to why are some mice sim more similar than other mice, um, well, there's a couple of variables that go into this that are not just about germline. Uh, we have their food source, their habitat. Uh, there's different things that can affect the DNA other than just germline. So the fact that you're trying to narrow it down to just the germline is a, it's a little uh, disingenuous, to be honest, because so, I mean, you know that. No, it's not disingenuous. Um, and I'm not talking about germline here, right? I, I mean, we are talking about heritability. I suppose germline is involved, right? You can't reproduce without the germline. But we're seeing a pattern across these three genes, and you can do it for every single gene in the genome, where the mouse is going to be very similar to the other rodents. It's going to be less similar to humans, but then it's even less similar to these other two animals. That even though that these other two animals look basically just like the rodents and they live like rodents and they behave like rodents. And I will give you a hint as to what it is. I'll reveal it. So these other rodents are um, not rodents. In fact, they are marsupials. They're marsupials that live and uh, look an awful lot like rodents. They have a rodent morphology, but they are marsupials. And so of course, most marsupials don't look a lot like rodents, right? We have the Tasmanian devil here. You've got the, the bushtail possum. You've got the koala. You've got the wombat. And the thing is, if you take one of the, rodent, the, the, the marsupials that I was showing you before, and if you compare its KV 1.1, the potassium voltage gated ion channel, to these other marsupials, a wombat, a koala, the Tasmanian devil, it's around like 99 some percent similar. But if you compare it to things that look I, uh, virtually identical to it, they are less similar. They are around 95% vers similar versus 99% similar. And you can do the same thing for all the other genes. We can look at KV 2.1. Again, comparing this guy to these, you know, marsupials that look nothing like this are much, much more similar on the protein and gene level than they are to animals that look a lot like it, right? 85% similar versus 99% similar. And you can do this for other things. Now, of course, you might say, well, that's an opossum, right? So, of course, opossums aren't rodents. Of course, I would say that this is an, an opossum that looks and acts exactly like a rodent. So you would expect it to have rodent genes. But there is a marsupial mouse. So there's a marsupial mouse that looks basically exactly like a mouse. Its genome is not fully sequenced, so we can't really compare it to other ones. But we can, and we have some of the genes. And its genome is very similar to wombats and Tasmanian devils and koalas and kangaroos, much more so than it is to things that look identical to it, like the mouse, you know, the rat, the, the deer mouse, the gerbil, right? 65% versus 80% similar. And you can do this for other animals. So I also pointed out the moles. Moles look very similar, but one of these moles is actually a marsupial mole. It, you would think it would have uh, mole genes but when we compare the, the, uh, the marsupial mole gene for this particular gene, and you compare it to these other moles, um, you can see it's around 70% to 75% similar. But when you compare the marsupial mole to mar other marsupials that look nothing like a mole, like a wombat and a koala and a Tasmanian devil, it's around 95% similar. Could you can not. keep doing this for all the other marsupials. And the reason why is because of convergent evolution. The uh, uh, the continent of Australia was uh, was um, uh, before was, you move on to that point, uh, Dr. Thompson. Sure, uh, I'd like to try to give them a chance to get back Fair in enough. on this a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, because thank I don't want you, to feel you, like too much about. <clears throat> um, yeah. So, uh, Chris, that uh, picture of that wombat was so looks so cool. It's huge. Um, really, it awesome looks creature. like cuddly, yeah, but I think it's probably tearing your face off. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, be nice, please, wombat. Um. <laughs> But uh, so um, I do think that uh, 
I just wanted to point out that here you do talk about how genetic, uh, there's genetic similarity with some that look same, maybe on the outside, they look like a mouse or they have a similar skeletal structure. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you get into how there is, how these similar looks can also have differences in genes, yet also when talking about like a chimp, you're doing similar genes as well. So it seems like you, they're, they're, it's, it is possible, depending on what you're looking at, you can lay out similarities and show how similarities can be grouped together to, um, to look closer related, but you can also group things together so that similarities can appear to uh, branch off into, into different animal groups. And I, I do think that maybe a reason why certain uh, marsupials uh, have similar rodent features or functions uh, <clears throat> or moles might have something to do with um, like the uh, potato famine in Ireland. Uh, there was just one like type of potato that got the, all the potatoes got wiped out because uh, they, they just they they were there was a, a plague basically the, the potatoes got destroyed. And so if you had something that came through and wiped out an entire population, like say all of the rats got wiped out uh, or all the moles got wiped out of, of uh, the existence of, of a region. If you have these marsupials that can still perform the same function, you're going to be able to have the, the roles that a mole carries out, like tilling the ground or doing these things. They're going to still be able to contribute to the ecosystem. Uh, so it, it would almost be like covering, okay, if, if we do lose this this creature, we're going to have another creature that is genetically different enough to not be affected by something, mm -hmm. but can still contribute to the ecosystem. So that role so it's is a backup. not being missed. Yeah, it's a, it'd be like a backup. So well, you're saying that, make is that Jesus well, another... made backup animals, and that's why marsupials have genetics that's more similar to each other but different from their counterparts that are placentals, despite the fact that they look so similar. So it's so now it's not about the, the way you're going to explain away the fact that they have common design, similar design, right? Similar shape and morphology, but very different genomes is so that we have a backup just in case. I believe God. I'd like to, uh, to let Jamie uh, uh, try to get in there and respond to that. Sure. One. Yeah, yeah. And then Go after Jamie him. responds, if Snake could respond to whatever Jamie says, that'd be great. That's fine. So the, the whole argument you made with comparative with comparative genetics is, I mean, really, you're just showing design features. You're showing that, you know, yeah, there are some animals that look different, but they have similar features. Well, if we go and compare these similar genetics, where like, for instance, whatever gene causes the fur, well, may, yeah, that's going to be similar because they both have fur that is similar to each other. So you're, you're comparing things and saying, oh, there's similarities, so therefore they evolve. Whereas there's, it could be used for the same argument for variations. Another point I like to make is you like to say these marsupials and these rodents look similar, so therefore that proves evolution. But that's based on a human-made classification system that's constantly changing. Okay, you still don't even know where to put the platypus. So like you don't have a solid, you don't have a solid classification system, and you're basing all of this on the way that your classification system is structured. So again, that's an assumption based on evolution. The entire lineus, the Carol, the entire lineus, careless lineus classification system is based on an evolutionary assumption. Whereas creationists, we are working on our own on our own classification system with the kinds, uh, but to this day, it's not nearly funded as much as it should be. So we haven't progressed as much as we would like. Um, yeah. So Carolus Linnaeus was a creationist, not. Mm -hmm. So it's not based on evolution. It is based on comparative anatomy and more modern ones have brought in comparative genomics. And these trees are not necessarily saying they are related. The lines don't mean related. They mean they, it just means similarity. Um, of course, we do draw the conclusion that they are related, but the, these are different things. Um, but you didn't seem to understand the point at all that uh, Dr. Thompson laid out. The point there was that uh, there is no pattern of common genes for common uh, parts or common designs. So we have the mole um, body plan from the creationist prediction it should predict that they would have similar genes for the similar parts, for the similar bodies, for the similar lifestyle. But that's not what we see at all. That was the, that was the point. Right. You could do it. Right. For but every what you're, what you're doing, though, but here's what you're doing, though. You're saying that based on the based on the similarities we should expect this 
But what you're doing is you're trying to limit whatever our creator decided to use to make these things. However, just DNA in itself is spectacularly complicated and you guys barely understand the, the ins and outs of DNA as it is. I mean, Absolutely. like for example, you brought up chromosome two fusion, right? The chromosome two fusion is missing majority of the, of the chromosomes that it, or not chromosomes, I can't remember the actual terminology of it, but it's supposed to be like 40,000 40, uh, DNA pair Base sequences pairs. or something mm -hmm. like that. And it's only 800. And then on top of that, how do you answer two chromosomes clashing together, morphing, and somehow becoming functional? These are very complex <laughs> DNA. This is very complex DNA. And you're saying that's it could just morph together and all of a sudden it still works. No, most so, of the times so, when you see something morph, it's going to fail. So we know that this happened in foxes because, I mean, it's a requirement that you guys need to have some common ancestry for certain kinds. I've never seen anyone dispute that foxes are related to other foxes, and yet we have different chromosome fusions and chromosome breakages within them because almost every single fox species has a different number of chromosomes. So we know based on creationist assumptions that that happened. Um, and then you're just kind of saying that the creator did it and just assuming it had a good reason. So, so the, there is a definite difference in the methodologies that are going on here. One is in fact, science and one is just assumptions with no evidence. Well, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that necessarily though, because yours is all based on assumptions as well. See, you're trying to say, we don't make any assumptions, but every single one of your conclusions is based off of an assumption. You see the same data we look at, we make an assumption, you make an assumption, and then you say our assumption is correct. So let's call it a hypothesis. One hypothesis is able to make predictions mm -hmm. that come true successfully. The other, I just showed one of the predictions, fails. Your hypothesis always fails and has no scientific use. That's not 100% that's not true either. I can give you probably three examples off the top of my head where the Bible was correct and it took us thousands of years to figure that out. Germline theory came from the Bible. Uh, oceans under the crust of the earth. Y'all no, rejected what? that for thousands of years. Y'all rejected that for thousands of years. And then guess what? We found oceans under the crust of the earth. Germ um, theory? Plenty of, yes, germ theory. Washing germ your hands theory came so from that you the don't Bible. get disease. That came from the Bible. Yes, that the is book 100% that, accurate. The book that says to cure leprosy, you dip a living bird in a dead bird's blood and spray it on your walls. Okay, so see, this is disingenuous of you because you know that that's a God intervention miracle. All of the sacrifices that were done in the Bible... Okay, well, then don't talk about the Bible if you don't know the Bible. The example you just used is an example of God intervening on behalf of a sacrifice. Okay, that's not science. Okay, now there, here's the thing. That's, we don't, we don't say science. we don't say that all of the Bible is scientific because not all of it is scientific. Some of it is miracles based on the creator that does not have to be limited by his creation. Okay? Based on what? However, however, you whenever you can't show that it's a miracle. Oh, oh, your standard of evidence so, is completely skewed. Right. You want us to have such an unreasonably high standard of evidence, but you want me to accept that it's a miracle based on Well, the nothing. miracles are things we don't observe I, I, in our Yeah, I'd like to get Nathan uh, to go ahead and respond and then go ahead and back to Dr. Thompson. Sure. If you have a miracle that happens, like uh, Jesus walking on water defies what we know about physics, that would be a miracle. Or when he uh, turned water into wine. These are miracles. These are things that are outside of the realm of science because science does not work on miracles. Evolution is reliant on one being a genesis. It defies 100% of all observations ever made. Uh, but miracles are outside of the realm of science. And so the Bible does have things that are, are miracles. There are, are um, kind of moral and ethic things in there. There are, are um, philosophical things. But then there are claims in the Bible that are scientifically testable. And then those are still valid to this day, That uh, which is why science can't falsify the Bible. The Bible isn't uh, in, in entirely a science book, and uh, you know, should it, it shouldn't be taught in science as a premise in science classes because I, I think it's not. Uh, it, there are not everyone subscribes to it. You can't force people to believe anything. But claims that are in the Bible that are scientific are are one thing. No philosophy or belief in origin should be taught in science. But we do have that. At all of us are supporting evolution being taught in science with our taxes. Um, despite that being a belief in origin, a belief in, in uh, cosmology and life. So <clears throat> I, I think that the, it, the, the scientific claims of the Bible are, are still true to this day, like washing yeah, your hands. Being before good your Chris hands. Thompson hops on, I want to kind of add to what he just said, and I'll be short. 
um, because you said that we hold you to a higher standard than the Bible. And that's not true. We hold the Bible to a very high standard. But the reason we hold evolution to such a high standard is because you claim it's a scientific fact. We don't claim the Bible is a scientific fact. You claim evolution is a scientific fact. So if you want to make that claim, now you're held to the standard of a scientific fact. We're, okay, so we're using it as science, right? Where we can make testable predictions based on observations that we can see in nature. And that sometimes those hypotheses fail. For instance, one time when it failed was when there was this, uh, you know, when we were initially trying to figure out the number of chromosomes that were going to be in the great apes, we assumed that the other great apes are going to have 23 chromosomes because we, you know, we already had very good reason to believe that they are, you know, recent, uh, you know, there was a recent common ancestor for all, all the great apes. Turns out that they had an extra pair of chromosomes. And so then from there, that so that's a failure of a hypothesis. So then you have to go back to the drawing board. This is what science is about. You're like, all right, so why did that fail? Well, let's make another prediction. And there was a specific prediction before we knew, had any evidence to support it, that there was going to be a chromosome fusion to explain it. That within humans, there would be one chromosome that would be compared, you know, that would be similar to two, two chromosomes within chimps and orangutans and gorillas. So, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a corrective mechanism that allows us to understand the world. And it's, I think it's great that science changes and adapts as it learns new evidence. Religion doesn't. Science. You have the conclusion at the end. You have a, a conclusion that you are drawing and you will deny everything that, uh, that that contradicts it and you will cherry pick little tiny bits and pieces to try to support it or just say, ah, eh, it was a miracle. This is why can it's I, true. Can I ask a, a hypothetical so, question? Um, <clears throat> so if you had like an incubator full of worms and you increase the temperature a couple degrees, maybe add some humidity. Um, when are those worms based on, because creation would predict those worms are going to stay worms. When would these worms become something else? Like when would they, when what might one become a type of insect or um, like a beetle or a type of fish? Well, because that, that would be a prediction that um, it is it's not able to be made because it's of not a, a randomness. No, it's not, it's a not a novel prediction. Evolution that's consistent with evolution too. Right, you're not going to predict that Static if population. you raise the the humidity and temperature on an, on a box of worms that they're going to give birth to fish. Um, well, that shouldn't they slowly maybe evolve limbs that start kind of popping out of the side, and then the limbs turn into. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's over, there's over. an issue of in within um you know within life of canalization and that you are trapped within your phylogeny so it's not <laughs> possible for a you know a worm to give birth to a fish like that is not going to happen gradualism mm -hmm. and uniformitarianism is the process and there has to be selection pressure on variation that can exist within a population that allows for that change to occur now we see this, we can see this even within kinds to an extraordinary level. Within the canids, right, the dogs, the foxes, and the wolves, there's an extraordinary variability that we see. Even just amongst the South American canids, right, we've got the main wolf, which eats fruit. You've got a very similar canid or on the genetic level, but it looks incredibly different, called the bush dog, which is one of the very few exclusively meat-eating um, uh, uh, mammals outside of the felines. And, and they're very, very similar to each other. You have a crab-eating fox that, that lives in South America. Um, and you've got another fox that uh, has webbed feet because it actually goes out and swims and hunts for fish. And th these are all animals that, you know, genetically, if we use molecular clocking dating to figure out when was the last common ancestor for them, is around 3 million years ago, which is only around 30% of when the, um, the entire canid uh, um, lineage would have uh, evolved right so From a single well, time what is the what is the standard of scientific evidence points. sorry what what is the standard of scientific evidence that that we can agree upon D is anything that i presented something we can agree on so hold on i'll i'll, I'll respond to that because basically what you're asking is what will i accept as evidence for evolution right that's what you want to know partially um, but what is what is okay. the, a standard we can apply to anything Okay, so first, before we switch over to that topic, uh, Chris Thompson brought up phylogeny, and I think this is probably the one thing that all evolutionists should avoid, because what you're saying is, based on the laws of monophyly and phylogeny, moving forward, a worm will never create a fish. But when we go backwards in time, we have all these animals that came from a single-celled organism. So see, you're, you're contradicting yourself. You're saying that it happened in the past, but it'll never happen in the future. That's contradiction. 
Now, uh, what you said, uh, Snake, like what can we agree upon so that we can work together, right? Um, I would say you need to be able to observe or at least observe enough to make an assumption. So by that standard, I would not accept reconstructions as evidence. Um, but if you can observe enough to make a reasonable assumption, then I'll accept the observation. Then you need to be able to test that observation, study the changes of that to see if it's beneficial or harmful because most of the time mutations are harmful and actually lead to the opposite of benefiting. It ends up devolving or deteriorating instead of progressing. And then from there, then you can make a final conclusion. But what you guys normally do, and I know this because I read the papers, um, I've gone very extensively over that nature paper that me and you are going to be debating next week. Um, but what they do is they first start with an evolutionary assumption, and then they base their observations, their study, their testing, and their final conclusion on the observation that was made before they even started any of this. Now, I think, too, that okay. we, we do have... Oh, go ahead, Taylor. Well, if you, were you going to respond about uh, phylogeny? Um, well, I was gonna, I wanted to address something that had, Chris had, had said about, uh, foxes and then also too, with, uh, like what we can agree on for science. Like, I, I do think there has to be some, an observation that you make, um, or an idea that you have, you set up a hypothesis, you set up an apparatus or, uh, conditions to test this, and then you run the experiments, you get your results, you make a conclusion. And then from there, whatever that conclusion is, you then can make an interpretation on it and infer based on what your worldview is. Um, and like, I, I do believe that someone who has been taught evolution uh, through uh, higher levels of, of school, even through public school, through high school, you're going to be going with an evolution worldview because that's the, the lens that you have. But I think the conclusions are made off of the experiment and the data, and then our interpretation gets put on it. But the worldview itself can be tested. So... Um, by the nature of the claim, it's stuff that happened in the past and stuff that takes a long time to happen. So we can't witness it directly, ignoring the fact that technically we you could say that we have a video it. of life history because rocks are images and we can sequence these images. And that's what a video is. But um, so it, it seems like you guys have kind of a vague standard of evidence, observe enough to make an assumption. Well, the question is, what is what is enough? So. Can you accept that prediction is a standard of uh, scientific evidence? Uh, yeah, you should be able to make make predictions at points. Okay. Predictions can be wrong, but being able to make predictions is something that uh, helps strengthen the. Um, if you if you make a prediction on something, it's it becomes more uh, it becomes stronger evidence because it has predictionary ability. Yeah. So as far as predictions go, I would also add to that. You can make predictions all you want. I actually encourage you to make predictions, but if you're altering the data to fit the predictions, that's when it's disingenuous. And that's what we see a lot of the time. I mean, how many, how many uh, fraudulent fossil formations can we bring up that show that, Hey, they, they fraudulently made a creature that did not exist to prove their prediction. We see that hey, all the are time. You are you talking about Tiktaalik? Oh no, I'm not talking about no, Tiktaalik. Like I'm talking about um nebraska Lucy, man okay. uh, yeah, we nebraska. can go through all of them. there's tons of them right. but yes because i know you recently personally... accused the scientists that described and found the total fossil of, of fraud yeah i was gonna say that i do believe that was a fraudulent piece because right. there was a skull and then a couple a couple of distance nope. a distance away on different layers they found a body they combined them together so yeah nope. that's disingenuous in my that didn't opinion. happen that's absolutely what happened no it's not what happened did you have you read the paper yeah, well, the paper is based on their evolutionary assumption, and of course, no. if they fraudulently put together a fossil, they're not going to admit that in their paper. They, I they even showed a picture of one of the Tiktaalik fossils that is partially embedded in rock. Right. So they didn't. It wasn't a combination. It's half of it's still in the rock. Fully articulated. That which means that it's together. No, because if you look at the pictures of the fossils, you can look up the pictures from the museum. Mm -hmm. The guy that discovered them is holding a box with the fossils. There's three separate pieces. And when you look up the oh. when you look up the paper of his discovery, he actually says the skull was found here and then the body was found here. It doesn't and say then that. It absolutely no, it does. Says, it does not. No, it doesn't. It says that there are three specimens. Yeah, that photo you're showing is fully articulated. Yes. That's fully articulated. That's a reconstruction. That's a cast That's not a reconstruction. reconstruction. That's not a fully articulated. It's a cast, cast but it's, it's a cast. 
of a reconstruction. Not of a reconstruction. They put, it to, they put together the pieces and then formed a cast out of no. that. That's not the original animal. No, they found it articulated. They found three specimens that were fully articulated. And then they found a total of a, around 30 specimens of bits and pieces. Okay. And so the video that you may have seen of bits and pieces of like a skull here, a pelvic girdle there, other things, that might have been what you've seen. But they had around 30 specimens. They describe that there are 30 specimens and they have three of them which are fully articulated. So not only was the formation of the, the, the morphology of this creature predicted, but the, the sequence of between which fossils was predicted yep. and precisely which actual rock date range was also predicted. That's yep. not this. You can't just do that by chance. And this has been done exactly. for fossil after fossil after fossil. Right. Well, you can take something like tectolic. You can say that uh, that the creator would use a spectrum in creating. The creator is going to make uh, things that uh, have long limbs, things that have short limbs, uh, things that have longer tails or shorter tails, uh, things that um, like uh, a whale or a dolphin that breathes through the top of its head. A creator is going to say, hey, I'll, I'll make these these sea creatures that can go up to the surface and, and put on a show for the people that are on boats. Uh, it, it's it's in uh, the, the creator is capable um, and all, all loving, all capable creator is, is able to make a wide variety of, of different um, kinds of creatures with different skeletal systems. And maybe why we don't have some of them today is because of the flood changes in the environment, um, things like that. And, and maybe even like big creatures maybe were hunted. So um, you could you could say that you can accommodate the data like that. But that hypothesis doesn't get us anywhere it doesn't it didn't find the fossils it doesn't predict anything specific yeah, and, and evolution fact, does so it, using a you, hypothesis you can if we know how it works or if we can predict how it works then we know how it works right and you made a specific prediction of common morphology means common design which must mean that the genes must be similar too which is why you, that's your explanation for why like bear genomes and wolf genomes are similar more similar than they are to primates because they have a similar morphology um of course that's consistent with the uh with the basic phylogenetic tree but it doesn't take into account the example that i showed of convergent evolution where you have common morphology but very different genetics underlying it well for and, for a, a, a part of the genome that is 80 percent, 80 percent is still um you know, pretty, it's not like it's only 5% of a genome. It, it's still a, a pretty big number. Like 80% uh, is, is a good amount. Um, especially I'm not sure what you're talking about. That for, for like the gene cones with the, with the rodents versus the marsupials. Oh, well, um, it like depends on what gene you're talking about, right? Some genes, you know, can tolerate only a certain level of mutation that can be inherited. And so they're going to have much higher similarity across disparate groups. Than, um, than other genes, which can tolerate a certain rate of mutation. And so we see variation. But the, when you compare a marsupial genome to a uh, placental genome, uh, it's always going to be different no matter what. It'll be much more different than if you compare amongst uh, within uh, placentals, like if you compare within rodents. It's gonna, you know, the rodents are going to be Which makes a lot of sense because placental birthing creatures are going to have genes to be able to, to do that. That's just one thing. Yeah. yeah. And speaking of, uh, so, okay, actually, I want to ask a question um, regarding creationist predictions. So you guys believe that Noah had a pairs of animals on the ark. And uh, this was 4,400 years ago, I believe, according to your time frame. So there, you know, according to the uh, answers in Genesis, it was around 1,300 some different kinds. Um, I know that there were uh, the clean animals. You had seven pairs, but there's a single pair, one male, one female for these other kinds. So I've already pointed out that that means within a single kind, you, you're going to have to have speciation on a, on a rapid rate, so much faster than you could possibly imagine that you're going to have what I think there's like 38 different species of canids within. So that means from one dog kind, we have the 38 different species of foxes and wolves and, and, and the dogs, right? So, um, but you can go even further to other, um, you know, huge range of different species amongst birds and uh, reptiles within a single kind. And it's, and it becomes impossible to explain it. But one problem is inbreeding. So a single pair means you have one male and one female within a kind. How did they avoid inbreeding depression with 
a single pair. Uh, uh, so let me just go ahead and Jamie, touch you on that right quick. Thing? Yeah, let me touch on that. Um, <clears throat> so as far as inbreeding goes, today inbreeding is a major problem because of the de deterioration of our genetics. However, in the original creation and roughly a thousand years after when the flood happened, the DNA was not as deteriorated. So inbreeding was not a problem. If you read the Bible and actually study the science behind it, you'll see that it was okay to marry close relatives up to a certain point. The, really, the deterioration of genetics would have started after the flood because before the flood, the, the earth was created in a way that prevented DNA uh, deterioration. Uh, the other How thing do you, you said know that doesn't make any sense? How do you it know does that? doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Well, because again, to believe I'm not claiming this to be 100% science, but based okay. on the creation models, this is what we would predict. And it actually makes sense because when we get over to uh, mutations, like you were saying, um, as you see the – or speciation, I'm sorry. As you see speciation, uh, we – have you ever heard of Amsterdam Island? Amsterdam Island, what? no. No, okay. So Amsterdam Island is the least, the least affected island on the planet by human beings. There are a couple of scientific observatories there, uh, but like the population is like 10 people for this giant island, right? And what they do there is they have animals on this island that they just naturally observe, and they're testing speciation rates. They're not trying to promote creation. They're not trying to promote evolution. They're just seeing how animals interact without human intervention. And when they calculate the speciation rates, the speciation rates are a lot faster than evolution would predict. So based on the speciation rates we see on Amsterdam Island, and according to your millions of years timeline, we should see way more animals than we see today. Well, why, why is um, Amsterdam there's... Island unique compared to the rest of the world? Well, the reason that I'm using that as an example is because it's somewhere where humans are not manipulating the DNA. So okay. what we can see, for example, is we have... I don't even know how many dogs we have now. There's like 400 types of dogs, yeah, right? Like that. But every single dog variation has human intervention in it it has the ecosystems affecting it because of all the pollution and buildings that we're making and you know there's ecological effects that we put on these animals so those artificial would be collection. um yeah those would be our artificial pressures sure. that we're putting on it but then we're also taking these animals and artificially selecting what gen what parts of the genes we want however mm -hmm. on amsterdam island this is a beautiful example of untouched variations and untouched speciation as you would use I would use the word speciation. You would use the word vari. Sorry, other way around. You guys would use speciation. I would use variation. Um, but so there's they're not they're not manipulating the animals. The ecosystem is basically untouched by humans, so they can see it naturally occurring, right? But the speciation rates don't line up with evolutionary timelines. So there's there's not one speciation rate. There's within the model of evolution there's punctuated equilibrium so there are periods of very rapid speciation and very slow speciation and this de can depend on the environment um and the environmental pressures so this is expected and I, well, I'm like to, go to, the flood, to, to like the animals coming off the flood uh they're also going to be guided by god those animals were led mm -hmm. by god to the ark they're going to be led by god off the ark cared for by god until they're able to get to where they're going spread Wait, the how do you know that i can project the, the protect the gene code uh, it, how, how do you know that well because that's what the bible says so the bible doesn't over, say yeah. that god protected the gene code well, no, that's actually exactly I, I what it says. I can tell the verse because I'm doing I'm doing a Bible study on every single verse of Genesis, and that's exactly what it says. God selected nice. which animals he wanted on there because he wanted no, to he preserve didn't. the seed of the planet. It doesn't say that. Um, Where does so, it say yeah. that? Uh, it's in Genesis. Uh, let's see. I'm on chapter 7, so I believe it was on chapter 6. I don't think Chapter so. 6 is where it says it. It doesn't um, say that God picked the particular animals to go on. That's exactly arc. what it says. So it clearly you have not, you have not taken guys. the time I mean, to maybe really I'm wrong observe on that, but the Bible. I read it today. Because, yeah, go look at chapter six. It's either okay. chapter six or chapter well, seven. And it says that God selected the animals that were going to go onto the ark. Noah didn't selected. have to go get the animals. And, and yeah, with, Noah didn't have well, to go we, get them. God brought the so animals So wait, how did Noah. that happen? How did that happen? God led the animals to the ark. And we don't know how? what, we don't know how many different kinds of dogs or types of dog-like creatures were brought to the ark. So we don't know exactly how many there of each kind there was what gene pools there were to work with right so but how did uh, god to, do that yeah so the question I, I really want to answer that question because i think you'll find this very That's interesting fine. um because oh sorry can i answer this question right quick before we move on go ahead go ahead okay yeah. um so i i have recently picked up the hobby of deer hunting right and what i've learned with deer hunting 
is that the deer follow a magnetic pattern of the earth based on the moon. So the deer's migration patterns are based on the magneti on the magnetism that comes from the moon. I forgot the actual term of it, but if you ask any deer hunter, they will tell you that they watch the charts of the moon because that will tell them where the deer are going to migrate. Okay. So if animals can be influenced by the magnetism of the earth, then why wouldn't God be able to control the magnetism to, di to divert them on the path they need to go to get to Noah's Ark? So you're, you're saying that God would have used the, the magnetic lines across the earth and manipulated those lines using built-in magnetic an perception, which we know not all animals have, only some of them do. And we know some of the neuroscience underlying it too, um, right. that that was the mechanism by which God drew the animals to the ark. Well, well God, so I'm not God saying that's the only one though. Too. Right. And it would only yeah. be two of them, right? Because wouldn't all the animals respond? Yeah, so here's the thing. I'm not saying every single them? animal, I'm not saying every single animal was based on that. I mean, uh -huh. honestly, we could leave it at God has the power to do whatever he wants within okay. his creation, and but that's one science. of the that's one and of the scientific responses to that question is that we know that animals can be I, no. herded based on the magnetism sure. of the earth. But how does so, that apply to a male and a female? One God male could also and one take female. over the animal's mind and say, animals, you're gonna go to this location, and maybe God didn't. You're talking God, to a neuroscientist. It's all capable. Okay. But it, it's it's a it's a miraculous intervention. Supernatural okay. intervention is not neuroscience. Right. Okay, magic. Yeah. yeah. Right. Shall we move on to the Q and A now? Females. Um, what we do, do we get? Uh, so, sorry. Magnets. Do we get any uh, closing statements or anything? Uh, that wasn't uh, part of the uh, yeah. format that I saw. But if you guys wanted oh, okay. to do one, I could give you guys each a like. What do you say? Uh, two, three minutes. I'd be okay with that. Yeah, if everyone's okay with that. Yeah, sure. All good. Everybody? Okay. All right, sounds good. We'll do closing Can statements. Um, uh, I believe that the uh, evolution side went first uh, at the beginning, so the evolution should go first at the uh, uh We we opened. Right. Creation, Are you opened? Okay, yeah, then you guys will go, go first. first. Sorry. How long if you guys I, open, then I want you guys to go statements? first so they can get the last word. I just like um, two minutes. It's just two is minutes? two minutes good? Okay. Yeah, per person or total? Uh, each person. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Great. Um, um, so, uh, if, if uh, creation went first at the beginning, then let's let creation go first uh, now, so that the um, evolution get the last word. So, uh, Nathan, if you want to go have the first one, then by all means. Um. Yeah. So, um, Chris did bring up foxes and and the diversity of eating that they have, and I, I do I did want to address that that uh, depending on what you eat can change. Um, certain things within your anatomy. I believe there was a lizard that was brought from one island of strictly vegetation to an island where there was insects and they actually developed like a flap in their intestinal tract to be able to handle the, the where they're getting, they were getting their nutrients from. So you can get changes based on what you're eating. Humans can change their gut microbiome with the foods that they eat, whether they're eating uh, animals or plants, uh, depends on how well they can handle TMAO. Uh, and so there are things that you can do that change your morphology or uh, your anatomy, your, your uh, gut microbiome and things like that. Uh, so those changes are, are there. Um, but I, I did want to say that uh, these are um, there. There are essentially what we are doing here is these are our two uh, philosophies that are trying to explain and interpret what we see as science. And the really the, the big thing that I really want to make here is is working together, collaborating with people to really get the best interpretations to help propel humanity forward is what we need. We need to know who we are, that we're all equal, or to know that we are um, here together. We should take care of one another. And I know animal mindsets can leak into um, certain people's thoughts and everything, and they can, um, and the, the military uses it and everything. That's why I opened with it is, is the, the, the main thing that like why I'm here is, is to uh, like, I want to know the truth and everything, but I think people, we all need to, to treat one another better in society. We have all these things going on that uh, I think if, if people uh, understood that we were specially created, that um, people's mindsets would change. You wouldn't be so likely to want to attack somebody because you want their stuff or uh, you have some vendetta against them. Uh, and so I really just uh, want to thank everyone for uh, the respectful discussion and um, the, the politeness and everything. Uh, so and, and everyone for their time and for hopefully listening with an open mind and hopefully we all learn uh, some things tonight um, for both sides. So. All right. And Jamie, your two minutes starts with your first word. 
All right, so there was a lot of things that we didn't really get to talk about, so I'm just going to kind of try and cover as many of them as I can before the timer runs out. Um, first, scientific method defined by philosophy. That's the exact quote that you took, uh, Taylor. You defined it from a source of philosophy, not a source of science. Uh, age of the Earth, there's a lot of built-in assumptions to that as far as radiometric dating goes. Uh, the age of the Earth cannot be relied on based on radiometric dating alone because that's based on the assumption that the Earth has already hit its equilibrium of 50,000 years. So, of course, according to your timeline, you would say that it already has, but that's an assumption you use to make that argument. Uh, the next thing was you said that creation is based on a feeling, and I would say that's just like evolution. You have a feeling that these things evolve, and then you start making all your predictions based on that. Uh, the next thing was comparative anatomy. Obviously, comparative anatomy, we can make the exact same argument, common design. Uh, fossil record, um, to me, that's proof of a flood. How else do you explain rapid burial in large amounts of sediments? Um, where are the erosion layers between all of these layers? We should see erosion marks throughout all of these layers. Um, another thing that I put for notes on there so I didn't forget is why didn't all these animals rot before they fossilized? Because today we don't see any animals fossilized. They rot, they get eaten, they get picked up by vultures. Was it just because vultures didn't exist? Lots of flaws there. Um, again, now as far as the variation goes and speciation goes, there's limits to the gene pool. Just like you said, a worm will never become a fish. Just like I say that a fish will never become a bird. So therefore, all of your trees of life should be thrown in the trash because we both agree that there are variations to the gene pool. You'll never see a lion jump out of its gene pool and start taking up the characteristics of a pterodactyl or of a um, giant bird that I can't think of off the top of my head. Uh, another thing was baromenology. Y'all like to hark on baromenology and say that, oh, it's so, it's so terrible. It has so many flaws. But the thing is, baromenology is still in the process of learning just like a lot of your fields of science are. So therefore, I don't think it's fair that you should expect it to be a professionally put together a piece of work when we have very low funding for it and there's still a lot of work that needs to be done just like a lot of your fields and time. i only got through about half so yeah all right uh evolution team uh whichever one of you wants to go first at your first word uh what do you prefer taylor you want to go first sure i'll just go, go ahead. yeah so yeah there is a philosophy to science um because there is th we had to think up a method to figure out how things work so that is and you guys agreed to that that to these criteria for science um so which is better um which whichever one produces results is better and more scientific i don't think evolutionary conclusions make us treat people badly in fact life being um temporary <laughs> makes it more valuable um so we there are predictions that can't be confirmed that you gave reading in the past wouldn't be a problem um did i just get muted Sorry. Um, uh, so there, so there's preclusionary evidence for um, creation. Um, the heat problem, in fact, is makes creation impossible. Um, and it also confirms radiometric dating. Because if radiometric dating is wrong, then we have a heat problem and the Earth doesn't exist anymore. It's just a molten ball of lava. And life definitely doesn't exist. So you guys agreed that we don't have to witness something directly in order to confirm it scientifically. I agree. Um, you say we have to observe enough to make um, a good inference. Um, successful predictions reliably is, is scientific um, enough to make these inferences. Um, and so let's just compare for a second the difference in the evidence. So we had from both interlocutors here explained things based on what you said, feelings and, and mostly miracles. So uh, on the other hand, evolution has um, tons of data, tons of predictions, testable predictions. And while some of that data might have some minor holes, that's still mountains of evidence and no miracles, no magic, no nothing like that and is meets the scientific definition so thank you All right. thank you so much nick and dr thompson great so i would thank modern day debates for having me here kaz doing a great job and also our you know our opponents it's been a good discussion pretty you know hot and heated in a couple of places but very respectful for for the most part which is really great so you know the thing that i will say though is what something that uh, taylor laid out really great in your introduction, as well as, um, you know, I mentioned as well that this the creationist mindset is one that is uh, where the it's begging the question that you have a conclusion that you want to draw and you will go out and find the evidence to support that. And that is it. And you're going to ignore all preclusionary evidence. You're going to try to explain it away. And anything that 
interrupts or makes it basically impossible for that model to work is then explained with completely non-natural mechanisms. And as we highlighted, there are so many, so many problems in the creationist model. It just does not make sense with the evidence that is out there. Uh, the evidence is completely consistent with the idea that the earth is old, that there was descent with modification, that natural selection is a process that can work on random mutation in a non-random way to generate novelty within kinds, right? We all agree within kinds, there's some incredible novelty that has occurred, but where does the kind end? And, you know, Taylor laid it out really great on you get to the roots, they are similar. And now you're within a another kind as you go back and past. And that is the point of gradualism that you are trapped within your phylogeny, but it will change over time depending upon selection pressures that, it, you know, an organism, a group of organisms faces in the environment. We haven't had any good answers from creationists on the, the problems with their theory. And mostly it's a reversion to magic. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks again for everyone listening. I, you know, I've got a YouTube channel as well. You can see the link in the description. Um, I talk about neuroscience and this kind of thing too. So. All right. Awesome. So we will go ahead and kick it over to the Q&A section. I want to remind everybody that if you have a question or a comment for one of tonight's debaters, fire into the live chat and tag me at Modern Day Debate. Of course, the super chats will be read first. They will get priority. And uh I want to tell everybody that we will have an after show on my channel. That link is also in the description below. And if you like what you heard from any of the tonight's guests, please don't hesitate to click their links. So with that, we will go ahead and move into the Q&A. And let me go ahead and pull up the first question I have for our debaters. This one comes in from Bubblegum Gun. This for uh, $2. Thank you so much, Bubblegum. They say to Chris, 1v1 me on MDD already. Why are you running? <laughs> So it's Jamie shaking his head. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think Andy wants that, uh, and I think I'd rather pull my, pull my eyes out. But uh, you, you could argue with anyone here, right, Bubblegum, on the origin of dogs, because uh, I think we all agree yeah. that they evolved from wolves. So, hey, Chris, I'll. Have to be just I'll... Me. I would like to say that this is one thing me and you can solidly agree yes. on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Got another one from Bubblegum Gun for $2. They say Christians are evolutionists light, not creationists. Coming at you, creationists. Are yeah. evolutionists, are creationists what? Yeah, he thinks that Christians creationists are, are like watered down light. evolutionists. Yeah. Yeah. What so about the you people probably, that say that creationists believe in like a hyper evolution because of the forty four hundred yeah. year, like right? Yeah. So he, he, I don't. You've never met Bubblegum, but Bubblegum literally believes that like every single animal on the earth never evolved. Uh, there's no variations in the gene pool, even though we can test that. Uh, wow. So yeah, he's That's like better. very um, polytheistic or something like that. I don't know, but when he boils down to it, he's a Satanist. He thinks every oh, dog species was separately created. Right. Yeah, his god is chaos. He admits it. So, yeah, he's a Satanist that wow. pretends that he believes in the creator. <laughs> All kinds. Hmm. <laughs> All right. So another one from uh, Mick Grievous for $4.99, uh, I think, pounds. To Jamie, you said, we've never seen life come from non-life, quote unquote. We've never seen a god create life from nothing either. Why the double standard? Well, it's not a double standard because, again, I'm not saying that it's our religion is 100% fact. There are scientific aspects to our religion that cannot be disproven, and we can make predictions based on the Bible that do come true. A perfect example that I mentioned earlier was the fact that we predicted there'd be oceans under the earth. And guess what? There's oceans under the earth. For a long time, creationists and atheists thought that that was absurd, and they called us nuts until they found the oceans under the earth. So there are things that can be proven in the Bible by science, but overall, the book is still a religious book. There are aspects to it that are things that were affected by God's intervention, and that's what we call a miracle. Um, so again, it's not a double standard because I'm not claiming the Bible is 100% scientific fact. However, evolution is, so therefore, they have a higher standard to stand up to. Got it. Can, I, can I add something to that real quick? Sure. By what that, uh so we we claim that ours is a faith 
not that ours is a science. So there's a difference between a standard for science claims versus faith claims. And I just wanted to add this because uh, I, I think it's very important. We claim to take the, vi the Bible on faith uh, because how can you claim to love God who you cannot see if you cannot show that fellow that love to your fellow man who you can see? So it's very important that we do have faith in the creator and it's not a knowledge or something that we can prove it. But we also don't claim to want to teach God in science classes. Yeah. And, and so so evolution meets the standard of sciences. But what it seems like is you guys dial up the standard past that which is ex accepted in science just to to try and make evolution not be able to meet that. Uh, you guys want to have the last word real quick? Well, if you're uh, going to what's yeah, you go ahead. Should we you... I was just going to so like if you're going to claim to be a science, the people don't disagree with evolution as in changes in a gene pool over time. That happens. But people do disagree with Darwinian evolution and common ancestor. And if evolution is going to be a science all the way through uh, going back into the origin of life is one thing that that has to happen. Having an increase in both order and energy uh, at the same time ha spontaneous or has to happen. Um, and so those are, are things that are, some, if you're going to claim evolution is a natural science all the way through, those all have to be naturally demonstrated and they have never been demonstrated. Yeah. And to add to that, just like you guys will reject cosmic evolution, stellar evolution, abiogenesis, you want to ob object all of those, but then still say that evolution is possible. Um, we accept variations. We would prefer not to call it microevolution. We accept the five stages are all fairy tales based on your faith. Got it. All right. Next super chat comes in from Kaladin for $10. They say, for creationists, do you realize there are billions of planets in the observable universe? Think of how many of those life-sustaining planets can be different kinds of species, societies, and culture. I don't even have to say anything to this. I'll just pull this up right here. Hold on. Wait for it. There we go. Yeah. So, yeah, imagine in all the different out there right <laughs> all we know is there's rocks out in space no one has gone to these planets and seen an alien okay so until one of those aliens comes crashing down which the demons will come crashing down and pretend they're aliens so you can expect that to happen based on the predictions of the bible but until those alien races come down and actually show pictures of their planet um that's just imagination and nasa doesn't even have pictures of the earth they admit that but there is uh there is well, what's up in the sky irrelevant. We have to n worry about how we treat one another here. Uh, I, what's what's on the ground is where we should would, should focus and and treating one another as as you know with dignity. All right, got it. From Pivot uh, Cryroy, I'm sorry, uh, for 11 euros, they say the hallmark of design is simplicity, not complexity. If something looks, smells, sounds, and functions like a mole. Why would a designer use a completely different blueprint DNA? Well, I think that's kind of narrowing down what we expect from creation, because if we would have actually got into the topic of ERVs, I could have showed how ERVs are a beautiful example of complex design. Um, but we didn't have time to get into that. And I don't have 10 minutes to make that response. So I won't get into it right now. But I see you shaking your head, Chris. So maybe we should have a one v one on ERVs. I would love to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sounds fun. Yeah, we can we can actually resurrect some of the ERVs into viruses, and a lot of them are methylated so that they're deactivated. So this claim that they're there because they're part of a design is demonstrably false. Well, I, for... I do think, like with with the the DNA. Um, there, there are similarities that are there, maybe for an ecosystem backup plan if something goes wrong, if, if God knows when species are going to go extinct or anything like that. He has things set in place so that it's kind of where creation claims that there's a fall that we're going through. So maybe there are controlled aspects to the fall so that it's not as bad as it could be right away or anything like that. Um, but then there also does have to be similarities in, in creatures because we all have to, I mean... We, pretty much a lot of creatures eat plants or eat animals that eat plants. I think those are the only two options. So you have to have certain similarities to be able to handle similar nutrients. 
but but they're already in different environments and you know we might expect them to have different immunities that's that's perfectly fine but that the fact that marsupials you know they're they're all in australia compared right. to the other rodents that are spread across all the world in different environments that that would seem to be able to have enough redundancy on its own well do you think that a marsupial going to Austra leaving australia and going to another climate like if they went to gradually made their way up to norway they could adapt uh sure it's just that there's a there's no land bridge yeah, it's a lot of ocean in between and it's been like that for 125 million years you believe i mean but if you raise or lower the water if you lower the water level you, you could get yeah i think no, that's reasonable yeah. yeah it's actually one thing oh, about pangea it's like they just fit south uh south they do. america they fit and africa well. and it's like mm -hmm. if you just lower the the sea level 20 feet it'd be look completely different it's anyway anyway sorry that's off topic so my apologies all right and just let everybody know that we don't have too many super chats on the list at the moment so if you want to make sure that your question gets read now would be a great time to send in a super chat uh next one comes in from big bad mama for two dollars to jamie do you believe in speciation after the flood ah big bad mama one of my uh best frenemies um <laughs> So, yeah, I believe in variation after the flood. I wouldn't say speciation because I think that there might be different characteristics of variation. Um, when you use the term speciation, you're automatically assuming or building in the assumption that it's going to follow all the characteristics of what evolutionists would design, would define speciation. So I do believe in variation, um, but I don't see that variation going past a certain point. And we can test that by artificially selecting things. And when we do that, we see that there are limits to how far we can push the genetic pool. I, I wish we talked more about this because I, I wanted to explore what the limits are. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that just because dogs, you know, we can't breed wings on dogs or something like that. I don't understand where the limitation is still um, because we can change the shapes of dogs. I want to know how, we... how far that can go. Um, yeah. There, well, there are size limitations, like there are people that want to breed bigger cows, uh, but they can't get them to become super massive, like 90 feet tall. And if you take like you, you showed in your opening, because uh, there's limits. And so if you, sure. you showed in your opener that it, uh, the, the, the shrinking of hind limbs, what if you ran it back the other way? Can those legs become or fins become massive and become 20 feet long? Uh, and, yeah, I mean, and the... Uh, a good a good counter argument to that for the evolutionist is if all of these animals eventually evolved from the same line, um, why can't we get a cow as tall as a giraffe? You know, because giraffes obviously exist. Cows exist. They came from the same line. So why can't we get a cow, a giraffe cow? Right. It has everything to do with selection pressure. Right. Uh -huh. And there the environment isn't selecting for a giraffe cow the cows are able to reproduce and make fine and, and make babies on their own until environment changes again. And then it no longer happens. See, Taylor's and if I, I could, I thought this was Photoshopped at first, but this is in fact a super massive cow that is like six feet tall at the shoulders or something. Um, let me see if I can play it. It's too big so, for the slaughterhouse. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so I agree. You can't get a 90-foot cow. But right. I think there are reasonable things. Like, can you get a dog to have, um, m like, more webbed feet, mm -hmm. for example, so that it's more ad better adapted to living a more aquatic lifestyle? Things like well, that, that are more reasonable. Well, that was just an example of, of how there are limitations to a gene pool. And there's also limitations to uh, a gene, uh, like gene pools that can that can breed with one another and everything. And I'm just curious, like if there was, if you had a cow, could you artificially select for it to become more draft-like and develop a reflex where it can snap its neck up in a fraction of a second and start running? Like would a cow, as you're artificially selecting for it to become a draft, be able to to gain that function as well. Cause that's a necessity. If a draft is being chased or about to be chased, it has to be able well, to hightail it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, could you breed a cow with a longer neck than usual? Right. That it, you is, could do that, that, but it's, you're not going to turn you... it into a giraffe because yeah. it's, it's still got 
cow it's got yeah. it's canalized right there's but, a concept of canalization i encourage you to look this up limitations you are restricted <laughs> to your your yeah. your lineage and yeah. well yeah um, you admit to you limitations can get extraordinary variation within the lineage um to the point where you can have an entire new branch come about especially in say post um extinction events that's where you have this that you know as, as taylor pointed out punctuated equilibrium and massive expansion of of all kinds of different animals coming about when all the dinosaurs were gone you had mammals that were still around they're mostly small but they survived and they they made it way they made their way through the, the kt extinction and uh, all these niches are now open they were they were previously occupied by these giant dinosaurs and that's when you yeah, had you, you know massive expansion and variation come about yeah, to the would, point where you have never, new kinds. You you would never be able to get an exact giraffe and def right. probably not breedable with giraffes unless cows already had that capability. But would you be able to get um, a population of cows that had, you know, two inches longer necks? Okay, well, you take that population. Could you add two inches to that? Could you add two inches to that later on? So is there any reasonable limit? That would preclude... If you could show... That okay, the neck just somehow knows not to get this long. That would be a great preclusionary evidence for evolution. But I well, don't and that would growing growing the neck. If if you could get a cow population to get the longer neck, you already have the information in your gene code to be able to to make a neck. So adding length is just like there are taller and shorter people. Um, but then if you could get a cow population to be able to produce offspring with draft, that would be something. Um, I think there are examples. That would be something. There are examples. Yeah. Let's let the creation have, have the, um, the last oh, word real quick, and then we can move yeah, on. Yeah, go to ahead. Question. That's fine. Um, well, and I, I did just want to say that right now, like <clears throat> with uh, uh, all of our our scientific data, there are there are claims that are maybe gray areas here or there for for creation to to pin down what a kind is, especially because we don't really our our kind and our way of of classifying things might be different than what God decided was a kind to bring on the ark. Um, so I think it's, it's two different mindsets approaching it. Um, but right now, all of our observations do show that the, the claim that evolution has with one population being able to become mushroom plants and animal cells, different distinct bifurcations in each of those lineages, uh, that has never been observed. We have never observed these macro changes, uh, which is why like creationists can agree with the evolution on the micro scale changes in population. That's everyone agrees to that, except for apparently this bubblegum guy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but the evolution claim where it, all of where you can get a mushroom and a rat to come from the same lineage is something that we have never observed. And I get that there's an appeal to time there, but that is just something that we've never observed to, to confirm. Cause if you can confirm that you can't deny an observation. So we really must move on. Uh, from skeptics and scoundrels, for ten dollars, they ask, "What is the falsification criterion for creationism?" In other words, if you were wrong, how would you know? For example, finding a rabbit fossil in Precambrian era rock would falsify evolution. Uh, so, um, what would falsify creation? Uh, the Bible says that God has to breathe life into life, and so. Um, if you can show non-life becoming alive naturally, that would falsify creation. Um, and I, I also uh, emphasize that point, though. He said you would have to do it naturally. That means you can't have intelligent input to create the life. That's yeah. The you, you can't buy equation. amino acid profiles. You can't buy a bi a bilipid fossil uh, fossil bilipid membrane. Uh, you can't buy any of these things with integrated proteins. You have to assemble all of these things from scratch put them all together uh, naturally, let them form. You can't, you can't, so, excuse me, you cannot put them together. They have to come together naturally on their own and then form a functioning life that would falsify creation. And I actually would like to say, I went to my biology professor and I did ask her, we got into a little bit of a discussion about this. And I actually asked her what would falsify evolution. And she did not know. She said, I have no idea what would falsify it. So uh, like what, I guess I, I, I mean, I could ask what would falsify evolution uh, because we can show that uh, um, that mushrooms will not have any lineage uh, affiliation with people, but evolution says they come from one. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I actually asked my professor okay. that same question. I was like, what would falsify evolution? And they literally told me nothing because evolution is a fact. So that just shows that there is a serious bias that they are relying on. And no matter what you say, if it goes against their bias, they discredit it. 
I, I think it just shows that the teachers aren't debate bros like us. Yep. Um, <laughs> They're trying but, not um, to be controversial. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. But, and falsification is, is, is an important part of a, if you propose a scientific science, idea, yeah. there has to be an element of falsification to it. And yeah, it is pretty striking that uh, professors who teach the subjects do not know what would falsify their own but ideas. The, the commenter came up with a great, uh, you know, option, a, a rabbit fossil in the cam like pre-Cambrian rock. Mm -hmm. or, or what I said, I'll give you is, all a good falsification. If you, so <clears throat> you can demonstrate without intelligent input, like you can add pressures to it, but you cannot manipulate it. But you, if you can take a fish and somehow turn that into a bird without adding anything or removing anything, w as far as artificially selecting, then maybe I'll start considering evolution again. And there was some, there was an so, article about uh, they got feathers to grow from a crocodile or something like that, but they had to take feather DNA coding and put it into a, a an embryo. So that would be like artificial selection. And the Bible even taught, like covers that with like that there will be breeding of humans with animals and uh, like all the pig cloning ears and stuff, human ears, all that funky stuff is all artificial, but using stuff that was already already made by by God, it's not a natural I'm, forming. I'm not familiar with that one, but I do know about um, an experiment where they took retinoic acid and added it to developing crocodiles, and they got feather like buds um, that had, you know, basic mm -hmm. feather structure. Um, but another th thing that could falsify evolution, as I brought up, is show us a, a limiter that would say, like, for example, either, you know, the whale series of evolution or a take, take an otter type body and say, okay, its hind legs can't um, become more rigid and more flap-like to be more like a seal, something like that. You, because we know these, these types of things happen. We know fish, for example, can develop different shaped fins, even within the same species. And we know fish can walk on land. So we know that the, there is this dual function to certain body parts and, mm -hmm. and, and change to certain body parts and and the dependencies and environment that they adapt to can change as well yeah the multiple there is, lineages um, that, sorry the multiple lineages that we've seen and just amongst mammals going back into the to the water right the separate lineages that um you know it's completely consistent with the idea that you can have massive morphological change to adapt to certain pressures certain environmental pressures and take advantage of certain niches. Um, and that that morphological change clearly will span across kinds. Now to say, have a fish turn into a bird, uh, you know, most scientists need to accomplish their research within a year or a couple of years. You're talking about replicating 200 million years of evolution, you know, when, uh, you know, you've got a graduate student who wants to graduate in five years. And I'm sorry, you're not gonna be able to have a graduate student wait 200 million years to observe yeah, so, so right. when so, you, in, so when you answer, invoke the millions of years, though, yeah, I just want to mention when you invoke change. millions of years, you're creating a paradox. So the whole idea of, oh, we can't do it because millions of years, well, now you're making a claim that you'll never be able to prove, and you will admit that, but you still want to sure. claim it's a scientific fact. That's but a we paradox. Can, it's not but science. we can predict how life changed with evolution throughout mm -hmm. the fossil record. So, right. so that does confirm it indirectly. And but then the, the genetic evidence is use, completely consistent with we it. Can, yeah, we can also use things that we agree on, which is that th there is an amount of diversity that we agree on. So the But the amount of diversity that it would take to take an otter or some other larger mammal into a seal is smaller amount of change than is what you already accept within the biblical kinds that came off the ark yeah but see that right. that never goes past them, uh, the finish. limitations of very vari variations though but it's smaller than the limitations that we agree on <laughs> well okay, and well, i do think that there well, creation, is let's like, have the uh, last word and then we can yeah, go on to the next question um there is with like uh that the cows not being able to become 90 feet but evolution does say in their own model that a cow type of creature went into the water and became whales which can get pretty large so it suddenly now because it changed its environment it, it loses this ability to to gain in size uh and i do want to say too to like the ability for like some fish that can breathe air uh or that can you uh walk on 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 dirt uh th that's a testament to our our creative uh our create creators creative ability to be able to make a vast variety of 
uh, amazing and, and magnificent, beautiful creatures that do all sorts of stunning things. I wanna, I wanna hug that wombat. I'm just saying, like all right. that thing. Uh, <laughs> it's cool, really cool creature. So, uh, yeah. anyway, that's I just a testament to the to the glory of our Creator is the the beautiful creatures that we have. All right, I appreciate it, you guys. And I'm sorry that I don't have any more questions for the evolutionists, but um, it seems that they're coming after the creationists tonight. But I am trying to let you guys have some time. Good, to scrutinize, um, scrutiny, embrace scrutiny. Yeah, we actually enjoy so, uh, the criticism because it gives us more things to research. So when you make an argument and I say, hey, that's a good argument, now that gives me something to fill my time with and go study. Whereas it usually seems like when I give an argument to a creationist or evolutionist, they usually try and dismiss it and then never actually look into the claim other than to say that creation is crazy. Uh, there was one guy I wanted to give a shout out to in the chat, though, uh, because I said uh, for falsification, give me a fish and turn it into a bird. And he said, does flying fish count? So I thought that was pretty hilarious. I just wanted to point that out. It's nice pretty good. Those aren't fishes, right? <laughs> it's not really flying, so hate though. Stairs. It's jumping and gliding. <laughs> but I thought that so was funny, from... so I wanted to point that out. So uh, Super Chat comes in from Hates Stairs for $5, they say, to the creationists. If we were so intelligently designed, why do humans have an appendix? The appendix is not vestigial. It actually does have function for your immune system. Uh, we do overwhelm it because we're not like uh, people who consume animal products are putting a lot of extra toxins in their body that the body, the digestive system is not really meant to handle primarily. It's a sec secondarily it can, but uh, you, you overwhelm your appendix, but your appendix is actually responsible for immune functions. Like you do repopulate your colon with bacteria using the appendix. People who have their appendix removed are more susceptible to certain uh, ailments and things that can happen to them and complications. Uh, can't give medical advice or anything, but like if your appendix is about to explode, you got to do something about it. It's, it's not uh, a vestigial thing. That's a vestigial is something that uh, it would, it would also be a loss to, um, which would uh, encom uh, encompass the fall and, and thermodynamics and winding down and everything moving towards chaos. Um, but uh, that that is uh, the appendix does does have function. Um, there there is a function to that. Okay. Uh, well, from what, Mr. what I would Arcea. say, if, if real quick, I, I would just say that vestigial doesn't mean it has no function. It just means that it had a different ancestral function. Yep. Well, then you could get like convergent, uh, or what is it, like a reactivation of um, body parts. Uh, I'm blanking on, on what the, the term is for is it. Atavism, uh, maybe? But it, it would be. It's. I don't know if it's convergent. It's not convergent evolution, but it's like um, it's when you reaccess something from the past um, to to start using it again, and that's like when you uh, you you can switch your um, how your body metabolizes things depending on what you put in your body, uh, and so like you can go back and access these things, or like uh, that lizard that I had mentioned that can grow the the flap in its intestinal tract is has to do with. Yeah, the the adaptive ability, but there there are changes that that can happen. But these, these that's the the whole point of like vestigial or non useless things. There are no useless things in our body. Things things might be shrinking or and may, might lose function, but that also isn't an adding of novel function. Yeah, I think that's adding novel structure. And, and junk oh, actually is not useless. It can stay in your junk drawer till you need it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we have this about uh, one question per minute for the rest of the time being. So uh, uh, any more super chats might get uh, we might we might not have time for them, but let's try to just uh, let the person who's being asked uh, answer the question, and then we'll move on and try to get through them as much as possible. Uh, from Mister Archaeopteryx for nine ninety nine for the creationists, I want to know if two different animals are related, quote like the same kind. Is there a method to determine this? Example: Are hyenas related to dogs? Are chi are cheetahs related to tigers? Explain. Yeah, so as far as kinds go, um, I think that it's just about as solid as a definition for creationists as species is for evolutionists. They change their definition of species all the time. Uh, but essentially, the most agreed upon definition of kinds is they could bring forth at some point in time. And whether or not they can now, that's not exactly a factor because we do know that ring species exist. So there are cases where animals that could bring forth at one time can no longer bring forth but that doesn't make them the same kind. That just shows that they have changed to the point where they're no longer compatible with each other. 
Um, so when you're trying to show the fine lines of one animal to another, uh, again, that's not exactly like a upfront, just one minute answer. Like you would have to really get into the specifics of it, just like how Chris Thompson can bring up his charts and talk about genetics for four hours. You know, it's kind of hard to give you that answer in one minute. All right. Next question comes in from Sunflower for $10. They say, if you reject God altogether, this is for the evolutionist, if you reject God altogether, that's one thing. But to grant God's existence for the sake of debate and then ask, how did he lead animals to the ark uh, indicates either bad faith or confusion beyond belief. Is that for us? That's for us. Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, because it's, I think, minimizing the miraculous explanations is the more honest way to go it's the um it's the more likely way to go um you could explain anything with magic so it's it's not a useful hypothesis right yes yeah if you open the door to miraculous intervention and magic uh anything can is possible that you can just allow anything to happen and so and if you're going to use that to explain away inconvenient observations that contradict your model then your model is is completely insufficient to be rigorous and stand up to actual observations and and, and it's not it's just not going to be a useful way of looking at the world because it just leads you down blind paths we've seen it over and over and over again and and accepting that okay. the question also becomes if if god is going to like manipulate the the magnetic currents and psychically block it from certain animals then why wouldn't he just teleport them right to the ark or sure. just skip the whole flood thing in, in in the first place well it would be a sign to those that have rejected god that they still have a chance to go to the ark An Cass, animals rejecting god i know, god? Just, I know no, no, a lot to the humans to the humans that rejected they, god they just want to add to okay. that uh if you well, uh, it's like the evolution said the last word on this one guys i'm sorry is also oh, we have to move on. To, like time I, I just want to say real Sorry. fast, I can stay longer a little bit if you want to get through some of the questions. If you want to, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't necessarily have to leave too. in five minutes. So. Yeah, I'd be I'd be fine okay. with that as well. Yeah. Well, however okay, long no the moderator is willing to stick around. As long as <laughs> just, uh, uh, I'm willing yeah, to stay yeah, here as long as you guys want around. to. Yeah, just uh, guys with the super chat, slow down, you know, because we don't want to be here for 15 hours. That's true. But... Yeah. <laughs> we All can be night, here for baby. a little bit, though. Yeah. Okay, from uh, Pivot uh, Kyroy, I believe that's how you say it, for six euros, they say, follow up, if God is omnipotent, why create backups rather than make a creature more adaptable to changes? Uh, so I actually God. responded to that in the live chat. Uh, in the live chat, I gave him an answer to that. Um, essentially, <laughs> the original creation was very different than the world that we live in today. And this idea of creating backups is God's way of having a response to the way that the earth is going to deteriorate based on our corruption of the environment due to sin and blatant disregard of God. God did not God. want man to fall, but God knew, okay, Adam is going to eventually fall and the world's going to have to go through this, set things up in place to make sure things can, you know, fall, you know, accordingly to give the most people the most chance uh, to, to find God, to find, find, find the creator the <laughs> upon yeah okay uh they also ask for six euros again pivot uh Cairo, thank you again so much in response to fish evolving into bird proving evolution <laughs> argument from the creationists this is happening this happening would disprove evolution not prove it uh not exactly because you look at your charts and that's what they show on the charts so yeah there was a population kind of, of fish and then some of the population branched off to be to remain fish and fish like and then the other kept going and became, uh, what is it, amphibians and then reptiles and then mammals and birds. And then so there was a fished population that eventually split and some did become birds, which would, if you could show that, I know appeal to time, but if you could show that, that would validate evolution as, as a worldview explanation and a, a falsify yeah. creation. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question is coming from uh, Mick Grievous for four ninety nine in pounds to Jamie. If you like studying so much, then why do you still think that a bird turning into a fish is something we would expect to see in evolution? Well, we kind of already answered that, but that's because it's what y'all teach in the science class. They show these charts and they say, here's a fish. And oh, later on down the line, a couple million years later, here's a bird. 
So that's what we're saying. Prove that. And then we can start talking about whether or not evolution has any scientific basis. Got it. And then from Zach Morgan for $9.99, if God can stop the murder of children and chooses not to, due to all of the children's who due to all the children who've been murdered, why does he want children to be murdered? All right. Uh, let me go ahead and respond to that one. Um, so mm -hmm. God brought his judgment <laughs> on the earth with the global flood. Okay. He judged us once and then he promised he would not judge us again until the end of time. So what we are seeing right now is we, God is allowing man to run his course until the day of judgment comes at the day of judgment. Every single person that has sinned will have to answer for their punishment. And that's why we spend so much time, people like me and uh, Nathan and uh, Kent Hoven and Donnie, we spend all of this time trying to get you people to realize this because the last thing we want to do is stand before God and have to witness against you because that is what's going to happen if you reject God. God loves all life. God loves us. God really loves us more than we could imagine. And if God weeps when he sees what someone is choosing to do with their free will, he weeps and feels unimaginably sad for the littlest things and for the biggest things like people who murder babies. But God does not. Those babies will have their their, their reward. There is justice in this creation. Uh, evolution, there, there wouldn't be. And I, I shouldn't even have brought evolution up there because this is completely... This is more than more than evolution, but this, yeah, this there, more there will be accountability thing. for for these um, these poor babies that have to to go through this. Um, and uh, God God really does care for us. But if, if you love someone unconditionally, you have to give them free will and let them choose. God didn't make us robots. He could have, but He lets everybody choose because then it's more genuine and it's more real. And as much hatred as there is for someone who murders the baby. There is genuine love for people who choose to love their children or one and one another. It's more genuine with the free will. And there's just so one more short thing I want to add to that question, though, um, because I get this question a lot from atheists and, you know, people that are skeptic of the Bible. And the truth is, they say, why does God allow bad things to happen? Well, the short answer is he's allowing free will to run its course. So what these people are telling us is that they want to have free will but they don't want to have the consequence of their free will. They want God to intervene and stop their free will. But then when he does that, AKA the global flood, he's a bad guy, right? So it's a catch 22, no matter which answer we give them, mm -hmm. they're going to wow. find a way to make it, make it their own. All right. Take a lot and of then, uh, from skeptics the and scoundrels is the last question on the list for $5. If it was demonstrated today that non-life could become life naturally with no intelligent input, what, would that make creation impossible? Uh, no, it would not make creation impossible, but it would give strength to the evolution side. And that's why I said I like to look at things from the way that evolutionists think because it's like, okay, well, if I was an evolutionist, what would I want to study to prove my point? And when I think of the things that I would study as an evolutionist to prove my point, most of the times they're not addressing these topics. Like abiogenesis, as many people that are working on it, they're not nearly focused on it as much as they should be if they're trying to prove their side of the argument. All right, I'll let you guys all just respond to whatever for a few minutes just to wrap it all up and then I'll close it up. If you guys and I do to think too that um, if you could show non-life becoming alive naturally in a beaker that you swirl around, change the pressure, change the temperature and do those types of things, introduce different uh, elements to it, um, molecules of elements to it. Uh, and then you created life and then there was a, a visible, like a cell there um, that would, you could still have a creator that created life. Um, but now we have a natural explanation for life arising from non-life. So I actually do think that that would falsify the Bible particularly or, or any religion that, that claims that God has to breathe life in. If, if God didn't have to breathe into the beaker, then that would mean that the Bible is false because the Bible says that God has to breathe life. So yeah, and one thing that Nathan said is he was talking about like adding molecules and all this. But I mean, I think that goes, I think that's a part of art of intelligent input because remember all of these molecules that they have in the lab, these are synthesized, they're purified, they're put in, you know, sealed cases. This is all part of intelligence. In order to create life without intelligent input, especially from nothing for the most part, you have to see it happen in the in in conditions where things are not preserved and purified. 
Yeah, I, I was talking about like if you took like rock and broke it up over a beaker and let it fall into a solution and and you know start to let off some of its elements. Not not like adding specific compounds that are man-made with the right chirality and and the right shape and structure and and everything like that. So I mean, the field of a. I mean, this is a debate about evolution. Which so abiogenesis is a separate question. But, you know, the field of abiogenesis, they've made enormous strides in um, in coming up with ideas and, and theories around how um, the origin of life could have happened. Uh, there, um, uh, there's still a lot that we don't know about abiogenesis, and that's fine. And we're talking about events that, would, uh, you know, according to our model, was around 4 billion years ago. It's These are early, early molecular events, and there's no fossil record for that because you're not going to see that in the fossil record, especially going back that far. So the um, the but, you know, it's enormous work. One one model that I have found pretty intriguing is the amyloid world hypothesis. I know there's a lot of emphasis on the RNA world hypothesis, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ideas out there that have some really intriguing um, underlying uh, evidence that, you know, we, we don't know exactly what happened. And it's a very difficult issue, but like it's it's being worked on. So. Can I, uh, yeah, Chris, yeah, in response um, to that, why why wouldn't we find like if you went down deep enough below like those the the first life form, why wouldn't you find traces of organic molecules that had attempted we do. to form like strings of you find sure. strings of RNA? No, so you down? won't find RNA. So uh, RNA DNA has a half life. We can get RNA, well, we can get DNA in any way. RNA has a half-life that's very, very short, but DNA is a relatively stable structure and you can extract DNA from fossils. Uh, this is where ancient genomes have become incredibly important in revealing an awful lot about human origins, but the origins of other recent evolution. The problem is the half-life is relatively short on the order of thousands of years. And so we can't really extract DNA from fossils that are older than around 100,000 years or so. Well, we, I'm saying we, like if, if you if you went way down in the earth and got to that very bottom line of like the, this is where the sure. first life form appeared above this point, uh, down here, would you find attempts of, of uh, DNA or RNA formation nope. or like phospholipid membranes? that are are there because wouldn't that those could be failed lines failed attempts at trying to burst up into the life realm uh there's so two problems with it the, all those things have like i said a half-life and then to be fully degraded and just completely decomposed uh into its basic raw elements the other problem is that old rock tends to not be as numerous on the earth as more recent rock and that's because of the, uh, the, you know, um, subduction of rock into the earth's crust, into the mantle. So you have a loss of like exposed older rock, but we do have some older rock. And in that old, old rock, you know, around 3 billion years old, we start to see stromatolites, which are collections of what we think are probably like some sort of bacterial element. And they're, they're actually quite enormous structures around, you know, starting around 3 billion years ago. And you don't see any evidence of multicellular life until you get into the, um, into the Precambrian fossils at the Ediacaran level. And I've got a great interview with a, an Ediacaran paleontologist in my YouTube channel um, where he shows like, you know, the complex environment of, and, and the, um, uh, the, the ecosystem that existed Precambrian, which is pretty cool. So and check it and out. if, be really if, if I could cool. add to, to um, a couple of things said, um, so abiogenesis experiments used purified um, molecules because we're not just going to sit around and wait for them to form naturally or form from scratch or you come. Some of them came from asteroids. You can find um, even stereo pure chemicals in asteroids or at least a, a bias for um, for that. Um, but yeah, it, it's a time saver. We've already shown that you can get uh, stereo pure amino acids uh things like that from from uh natural processes so once we've already proven that it's like okay so we're just gonna save some time eliminate some variables since we're testing something else now eventually once if we figure it all out eventually they'll probably make it as uh, natural and try and do it all mm -hmm. in one experiment um the other things were more related to the Bible. So I, even if a biogenesis is proven beyond a doubt, if we find out we can just put this in a hole in the dirt and a cell will crawl out, 
that won't disprove God or religion. Well, I'm not here to disprove God or religion with evolution or with abiogenesis. In fact, I think the greater God would use um, that. That's a greater design is a self assembling design. Um, mm-hmm. And and you can look at the the Bible, some of the parts poetically. And I think that it in fact is more valuable um, poetically, because if you look at it literally, then there becomes some contradictions in character and motivation and event. Um, and, and the other thing finally would be to touch on free will, which is that it, it seems it's not that we're just complaining about bad stuff happens. I lost my keys or, you know, or trying to not be um, accountable for, for, I don't know what free will even means, but that's a different concept. But it seems like the problem is it seems like God favors the free will of the murderer more than the murder victim is, is kind of the, the angle we're coming at it from. Well, yeah, see, I understand the angle you're coming from with the whole free will. God favors the murderer more than the victim. But see, the thing is that you want God to intervene on someone's free will. But then when he does that, which the perfect example is the flood, you call him a bad guy and an unjust God. So God judged the world once, and now he has made the promise that he is not going to judge the world until the end of time. So that's well, why yeah. now we don't see him judging the world, but he will judge the world. So this murderer is going to eventually have to face God. And when he faces God, he's going to go into eternal torment, which is absence from God. That is much worse than anything our judges today Unless can do on to a human. Well, yeah, well, right. we humans, we humans intervene on each other's free will all the time because it doesn't matter. I don't care about your free will if you're going to use it to do something bad. And I feel like a loving God would also have the same. Well, and, and that's uh, like opinions, you saying that God favors the, the free will of but, a murderer. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so if so the other thing I was going to say is if God. God judged the whole world um, during the flood, it seems like uh, the death penalty for every single man, woman, and child for for what? Are, are these children running around just like torturing and murdering each other? Remember, I, yeah, I every know. single so, child. So that goes planet. into the argument of age of accountability. So mm-hmm. there for, is an um, age of accountability that God has established. We see it in the Bible. Up to a certain age, children are not accountable for their actions because they don't have that level of reasoning. Some have argued that it's somewhere in the teenage years where they reach age of accountability. Some have argued that it's when the brain fully develops at like 25. You know, I think it varies per person because people develop differently. But God has established an age of accountability. So to say that these children running around are going to die and go to hell, uh, no, that's not true because they don't. They don't have the capacity to accept God yet because they have to be able to understand God before they can accept it. To bring it back to the topic of the debate, debate, though, is that like with the flood, (laughs) right, there were only eight people that were on the ark and they were all adults. Mm -hmm. And of course, the earth was populated with children, pregnant women. Right. Yeah. God killed them all. And well, this this goes actually it it actually mentions why in the Bible. So the people that were wiped out in the Bible during the flood, it says that. It says that all of their flesh was corrupted, not right. just that they were wicked. Their flesh was corrupted. So you have to keep in mind, these ancient civilizations, they were doing unnatural, disgusting things with their children. Even the and children? So, yeah, yeah. No, the, the grownups were doing it with the children. They so, were and the children were, the children. were they, like, because like the children like were Kids killed. were being taught sexual things, which. Right. What about were, the pregnant women? Well, yeah. So the pregnant women are corrupt, are the corrupt right. DNA. And, and that so the child baby. Is, up soon, guys. Yes. But see, here's the thing, though. The children and the babies that had to suffer that punishment, since they're not at the age of accountability, they're not going to suffer the same fate as their parents would have. They still have that age of accountability that plays for them. However, because they are corrupt and the whole goal of the global flood is to remove the corruption, it has to be removed. This goes back to the argument of genocide in the Bible, and we could do a whole debate on that and pull up all the scenarios, and I can show you exactly why every single one of them it was told to wipe out all of them. And I would love logical that. And I just reasons to I want to have quick. that debate. What but Taylor God said forbid, about uh, God forbid uh, God actually comes down and teaches them a better way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, he did. Right. That's why book, but Jesus. they chose Jesus not to the follow it. For man. Uh, yeah. and, but I, I did want to say God does favor the, pe- the people who choose life over the murderer because we live every day 
you you don't get murdered every day. There is there is definitely a favorite towards the people who choose life. And for the flood, uh, the people who it wasn't human beings like us that can choose good. And sometimes we do good. The Bible says that the people who were wiped out in the flood, evil and wickedness had become so ubiquitous throughout the world that there was no good left in people. These men, women and children were continuously thinking of evil things, wicked, how to how to kill, how to sacrifice um, perversions. Uh, like kids, they might like, I don't know, take a dollar out of your purse or something or do something like that. But these kids were doing wicked things continually. It was it was a it was a complete wicked takeover of the population of man, corruption with with the Nephilim, with the fallen angels that had caused people to become corrupt, become hybrid humans, uh, different DNA structures and everything. And they were they were evil um, and, and had no if you would have walked through and been like, hey, I'm just trying to be friendly and have a discussion like what we're doing now. They'd be like, no, I'm going to rob you, lie to you. I'm going to take all your stuff. I might, I might, you know, defile you and then sacrifice you. Like they, or these eat people you. Not- it was cannibals too. Yeah. So. Eat, you can Yeah. They, yeah. They eat your heart. I think like, a perfect God could come up with a better design where that didn't happen. Right. Except okay, so this goes happened. into the, this goes into the debate of why did God create a world where we can sin? Right. And I mean, that's a, that's a big discussion to cover in, 14 minutes all right but so. essentially got the whole well, this is not counting down let's count up yeah <laughs> yeah we're past <laughs> we're in oh, the after show up. now oh okay <laughs> yeah, yeah so the whole <laughs> reason that god created this world was to glorify him and part of glorifying him means that he has to be able to demonstrate that he can be forgiving and show grace now he can't be forgiving and show grace if there's nothing to forgive or show grace to so the fact that he gave us free will shows that he doesn't want to force us to worship him. The fact that he's willing to forgive us after we have blatantly gone against his teachings of the correct way to live, that shows his glory in forgiveness. So I know that it sucks to see this world full of corruption and sin and murderers and rapists and all of that. I know that sucks, but at the end of the day, God is allowing us our free will because he promised he would until the time comes where he judges everyone. It, it just right, seems evolution like team. There, last there word and let's wrap a, it up. Yeah, it, it just seems like there might be something in between, um, you know, no sin and everyone in the world except for four people is like completely and utterly just irredeemably crap. I, th- I feel like there's just a, maybe a little bit of a, a well, I mean, middle ground. It's, it's interesting there's that you bring left. that up because God did give people the option to go on the ark. Noah warned people for 120 years and 99.9% of them rejected it. After it rained, God gave them another seven days after the rain because the rain was the flood came from the fountains of the deep. The rain was not the flood. The rain was the sign to the people that Noah was right and God's going to judge the world. And they had seven days to get to that ark and get on before the flood waters came from the fountain of the deep. So even after God cast his judgment, he still gave an option of grace to everyone on earth. The fact that they rejected it is not God's fault. That's their fault. Okay, no yeah, more let's, rebuttals. Let's have this debate <laughs> separately <laughs> one day. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're me and me and Chloe are going to have a lot of debates in the future. So I can tell you guys could argue about this all day and night. But thank you all so much for being here. You are all the lifeblood of the show. We really appreciate it. I want to say thank you to everybody in the audience for participating and sending in super chats, and thank you to all the moderators in the chat for uh, keeping the discussion civil. Uh, I want to remind everybody that there's going to be a debate tomorrow that's going to be Matt Dillahunty versus Perfect Dawa at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And I want to let everybody know that there's going to be an after show on my channel coming up right after this. So if you uh, wanted to continue the conversation there, please join us. That link is in the description below. And uh, just wanted to say uh, thank you to James for creating this platform. And once again, the debaters who are the lifeblood of the show. So like it if you loved it, share it if you want to spread it, and subscribe. We have many more debates coming your way that you don't want to miss. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. And remember to keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Have a great night.